Welcome to participants to the Joint Hybrid Planning Board meeting of July 24th. Call to order. Ms. Craig? Here. Ms. Felicio? Here. Ms. Foley? Here. Ms. Stromley? Here. Ms. Philbrick? Here. Ms. Tenney? Here. Okay, thank you. Full quorum tonight. I'd like to remind all board members, guests, to ask to be recognized by the chair if you wish to speak, and this meeting's being recorded. Um, Gail won't be joining us tonight. FYI, but uh, first item on the agenda, uh, knowledge receipt of correspondence. Uh, Gail entered the public hearing notice for Wenham, decision Beverly, emails from Helen Bethel and MIPA, and then late a, an email from Donna First that I put in our packet. At this time, I will allow any public comments on items not on the agenda with a limited amount of time. Anybody from the public wish to speak? Please do so by raising your hand. Okay, with no, no uh, public speaking, the next item is the Downtown Improvement Committee presentation. Um, the slides were put in your meeting packet. And I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Carhart of the Downtown Improvement Committee to give us a presentation. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate your interest in what we're up to. Uh, as most of you know, the Downtown Improvement Committee is appointed by the Select Board. Uh, our history goes back to the original Downtown Improvement Project in 2001, I'm sorry, 2008. Uh, as time has evolved, the Select Board has asked us to get involved with various matters of policy as well as hardware and, and infrastructure. Uh, most recently, in addition to the project I'm going to show you tonight, we've been involved uh, with your work as well on, on downtown parking. Uh, we're also involved in coastal, the coastal resilience activity and the, uh, and the MBTA zoning project. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, um, Gordon, Gordon Brewster and uh, Kurt Svitaka, who have been our two uh, lead citizen uh, volunteers on this project. Um, uh, Gordon, as you know, is a professional engineer, is deeply involved in the rehab of the schools, among other things. And Kurt is, is a longtime member of Bikes and Ped and has kept that point of view in front of us as we go through this. Uh, the project we here, we're here to present uh, has been, uh, uh, at this level of detail, we've been working on the planning for a couple of years, including a lot of time walking around uh, the uh, town with our uh, the professional support of DPW and VHB, whom you'll see later. I do have a couple of slides that I just um, want to offer as a citizen's introduction to the project. Uh, Sarah, can you give me the, the first one? Yeah, I'm just making, I had to, I got um, Sure. Um, with, I don't know. Also, Chris okay. has been our liaison, right? Oh, yes. Uh, I, mean, I, I should, I should mention it. Chris has been there. And uh, Betsy uh, and her predecessor, uh, Sue, to always come to our meetings. And the, uh, our regular meeting is the uh, third Wednesday of the month at 8.30 a.m. And come one, come all. Now see me. Oh, here you are. Sorry, I got kicked out of the. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got a Sorry. Okay. It's very hard to do this when you only have one spring. You have a new Oh, oh, great. Thank you so much. Let me just uh, get rid of this. 2.0. There was a 1.0. There was a 1.0. Yeah, absolutely. Can you give me the next one there? Is it? Great. Okay, this is our mandate from the select board. Uh, so the area that we're concerned about here is uh, from Pine and Central here through downtown, over to Beach, out to uh, uh, Tappan Street, and then up Summer Street. So those are the areas where we're uh, charged to uh, pay attention uh, and uh, develop uh, 
good projects. Uh, the uh, phase one, the 1.0, is the area that you see in orange there, uh, which was done and finished in 2008. I would encourage anybody to take a close look at that and see how well the durability of the work that was done there uh, and the quality of the design and how that has held up since then, uh, which I think is a testament to uh, folks who were on the committee before we were. Uh, next slide, please. No, that one? Yeah, there we go. No. This is our secret master plan for downtown <laughs> Manchester. We would like to call it Merton Dickless and maintain this historic look and feel and modern functionality. Now we're not going to get all the way there, but this is kind of the picture in back of many of our minds that we're sort of moving moving towards and that we're thinking about as we're going forward. Now, sadly, that kind of look and feel and quality of maintenance is not the reality. And the motivation for this project is that we have taken a very critical look at what the reality of Manchester's downtown infrastructure is compared to what we would like to see. So the, the next few slides give you some, um, some pictures of what we are concerned about. And a lot of these things we kind of look over because we live here and that's how it always has been and so forth and we're, we're used to it. But if you look at it from a critical point of view and say, is this the kind of a place that a business would want to come to that want to say that, that, that this town really cares about its downtown, that it's a high quality place to do business, or people that would want to come and at some subconscious level are they going to see a place that is inviting and looks, looks well maintained and is, is generally high quality. These are the kinds of things we're trying to get at. So there's too much of our downtown which has uneven, poorly repaired bituminous sidewalk. Many of you may walk down Central Street, take a close look underneath, or uh, the absence of curbs altogether or haphazard bituminous curbs rather than high quality granite curbs that we're proposing to put in uh, across downtown. Next slide, please. Uh, we also note that the introduction of modern amenities has been haphazard, and if you take a critical look at it, uh, it really doesn't fit with the image that we would like to have in the historic district. These look like they're escaped from a 1950s horror movie. Um, we have, would like to extend the uh, historically correct uh, lamps that were put in in the downtown uh, phase one. Uh, similarly, uh, haphazardly installed overhead wires rather than undergrounding. Uh, we, we should mention that DPW warns us that actually undergrounding them uh, is, involves uh, negotiations with utilities and may be very complicated. But for start, for starters, we wanted to do wanted to underground anything in the downtown area. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing that we paid a lot of attention to is uh, pedestrian and bike uh, availability and safety. Uh, there's not a lot of room downtown, but we've gone to great lengths to try to get the best possible compromises uh, in place for all users uh, so that we have safety and mobility uh, and accessibility uh, for people as much as we can without radically changing the uh, the picture of downtown. So this is just one example where uh, there is no crosswalk between Pine Street and Elm Street. Uh, that's one example of where we're going to put in fresh crosswalk. Uh, similarly, on the uh, aesthetics and general amenities at the edge of the of the downtown infrastructure, uh, there are a number of places where the railings are simply aged and ugly, and where we can use some more street trees. So those are the kinds of things that we're uh, concerned about. Uh, I should mention at this point that on, on these kinds of things are entirely compatible with the civic space work, which has been briefed to us, and our, many of our members have been out in the field with civic space, and they sort of uh, just meld in with with uh, with uh, what we have here for the uh, hardware and the infrastructure. Next slide, please. So just to sum up, um, what we're talking about here is. Uh, Consistent, high-quality sidewalk scrubbing and lighting. Uh, we believe that this will, uh, since it is downtown, it is the heaviest use area and the most visible area. It is worth installing high-quality cement and uh, sidewalks and granite curbs, uh, which will reduce the cost of patchwork, uh, patchwork repairs. Uh, we're concerned, as we said, about safety and usability. 
uh, we would call attention to the fact that everyone is concerned about the, the advantage of having businesses in the limited commercial district, and that's fine. Uh, our charge is to be paying attention to our existing commercial district. We want to have a place that's inviting for customers and new businesses alike. Uh, I mentioned the historic uh, concern that we have. And the, the last thing I've mentioned is that we want to integrate this with the other downtown public works, as been, has been done with the uh, complete streets work earlier and will be done with the culvert work. Uh, and so the idea here is that every time, we may not do all this at once, but the idea is that every time we, we, we do something downtown, we have this in the back of our minds so that it's all integrated work as it gets completed. So with that, I'll turn it over to our professionals, uh, Chuck Dam and BHB, who will um, explain the very um, professional, detailed work that has gone into implementing these general objectives. Thanks, Steve. Uh, this is Chuck. Um, I guess hey, Chuck. I'll hand it over to also who's our consultant with BHB, uh, right. who gave a presentation. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. OK, yeah, and so. Uh, I think uh, she'd be the one to walk us through the project as she did a couple uh, weeks ago with the select board and um, I think uh, pretty much speaks for itself, but obviously we'll uh, stick around and take questions afterwards. Um, I'm not sure who's in control of the screen, but Elsa Jam is the uh, consultant with VHB that will, is on the call tonight, so if we could let her share her screen, I think she'll be able to walk us through it. How do I... Uh, what's the name? Also, Jim. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Okay, Elsa, you're uh, muted, but your uh, co-host, you can put up your slides. All right, thank you. Um, are your slides in this, or do, you, or do I stop sharing? Stop sharing. She, okay, she's great. Thank you. While they're waiting, one of the, I'm pretty sure the genesis of the downtown improvement project was with the planning board back many years ago. It was a consultant, and the the work then spun out to a subcommittee, but. Whatever it's worth. Okay. Can everyone see the slides? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. I think Steve pretty much did half of my presentation here already. <laughs> um, he did a good job in uh, explaining, you know, what, what the project objectives are and, you know, some of the stuff that we're trying to accomplish here as part of the phase two um, project here. Um, just kind of, you know, looking back. So you've already covered this project limits. We're looking at you know taking the uh, end of the project limit from Phase One um, from Central Street from Pine Street to Town Hall, um, and then Union Street between School Street and Union Street, Beach Street, and then Summer Street, just you know east of where the project limits are from Phase One, and also um, along Beach Street as well. Um, so part of the couple of the tasks and scope that we have is to kind of solicit feedback from you know what you guys liked, what you guys didn't like about the phase one improvements, um, to understand you know what you guys are concerned about. Um, a couple of things that we heard is to to retain existing parking counts within the downtown area, to improve safety and connectivity, to improve the aesthetics, uh, to use durable materials as well uh, for the for the phase two uh, portion of this project. Um, so, you know, the first task we did was to identify existing conditions. We did a site walk to understand, you know, the existing sidewalk conditions and gaps there, there are out there um, regarding pedestrian connectivity. I saw the desire lines, um, you know, the existing street lighting out there and streetscape and also the existing on-street parking situation uh, and restrictions as well. And then we then um, incorporated feedback from the DIPS committee um, based on the site visit and, you know, some um, preliminary conceptual design, and um, and then we kind of come up with the concepts that we're presenting here um, for the phase two roadway streetscape and mobility improvements. So Steve already kind of went over all these um, issues. 
um, regarding the project limits, but I'll just quickly kind of, you know, glide through these. A um, couple of the things that, you know, along Central Street is that there's pedestrian safety issues, especially at the Elm Street intersection there. Um, you know, visibility of pedestrians are tough because of the, the cars that are parked pretty close to the crosswalk. Uh, and then there's a lack of connectivity, pedestrian connectivity, because of the distance between the crossing at Elm Street. And then the next one is at Bridge Street. Um, and then, you know, there's um, also a pinch point, you know, right where number two is on the screen here. Um, the sidewalk itself is pretty narrow. Um, so it's an accessibility and also, you know, it kind of makes it challenging for pedestrians as well along the sidewalk. And lastly, as you mentioned, there are some utilities um, that, that would be nice to be underground uh, for aesthetics um, purposes here. <coughs> and then moving down to Union Street, um, you know, right outside the library, well, based on our understanding that, you know, the tree, well, there was a tree before and they pulled it out there. So there's this awkward bump out that that's right, located right in front of the library right now. Um, and then moving down to um, the crosswalk there, there's accessibility issues. The curb ramps are not accessible. Um, and then on the right side there, the picture is showing that, you know, because of the parking that's along um, the, this portion of Union Street, a lot of times, you know, the vehicles have to cross over the center line, which creates a safety um, issue here um, as far as, you know, people straddling um, across to the other side of the roadway just to bypass the parking here. And then along Beach Street, um, as you can see, there's pedestrian, um, some of the identified issues is the pedestrian connectivity and wayfinding issues. Um, and then the fence itself um, along Beach Street right there, um, it's also kind of antiquated and old and, you know, not, not, not the prettiest looking there. Um, and then the pedestrian safety right outside Captain Dusty there, um, especially during the summer months, it's pretty popular. So um, improving pedestrian safety at that location. And then the fourth one right at Tappan Street, the um, crosswalk, as you can see here, there's no curb ramps. It's just blurry run into the curb. Um, accessibility is an issue um, at this location. And then along Summer Street, um, the C Street at Washington Street intersection, that's, um, you know, there's some challenging um, operations and safety here, especially, you know, from C Street, it's kind of hard to see people who are coming southbound um, from uh, southbound Summer Street there. Um, and then there's no formalized parking, even though there's, you know, two hour parking along this stretch of Summer Street, um, there's no formalized parking. So it doesn't look very inviting as well um, for visitors to come up here into this section to park. And then lastly, the guardrail and railing that's alongside this stretch of Summer Street, um, it's substandard as well. So we kind of um, talked to the DIPS committee to understand the extent of improvements that we want to see under phase two. Uh, some of the stuff that you know we definitely want to kind of echo with what phase one had is to upgrade the sidewalks to cement concrete, um, definitely upgrading the curb ramps to be ADA compliant. Um, however, we want to keep the curb lines as it is, um, no significant roadway construction, um, and then better defined parking and improving crosswalks uh, and crossings along the project limit corridors as well. Um, and then, you know, the, the one thing is, you know, if we do have to reconstruct curb lines, it will be more towards, you know, improving pedestrian safety. So as far as study area, area wide improvements, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there will be new sidewalks and curb resets um, along the, the corridors, um, the project limits. And then the pedestrian um, and street lights will also be upgraded as part of this um, improvement, downtown improvement phase two, um, upgrading the accessibility at sidewalks and crosswalks. Um, however, we do want to maintain the existing pavement width and also the um, existing parking um, within the study area and also improving the landscape um, at, at the sidewalk along Beach Street there and also at the park edge. So for this stretch of Central Street, um, this is the concept plan for this, um, this section of the Central Street project limits. As you can see here, the yellow shows, you know, brand new sidewalks, um, brand new concrete sidewalks, and there's a pedestrian crossing that's provided um, between Pine Street and Elm Street, just west of Morseport there. Um, all the ADA curb ramps will be upgraded. 
Um, the crosswalk at Elm Street, um, that probably will be tied to the culvert project instead of um, this uh, phase two, because uh, that, that project is coming first. Um, and then to eliminate and alleviate the pinch point where I was talking about earlier along the sidewalk on the south side, uh, we were able to kind of shift the roadway a slight bit just to kind of steal a lot of space to um, increase the sidewalk with oh, at that location. And then um, lastly, you know, it's it that's um, for the utility to go underground. That's more of a longer term um, improvement. And then for Union Street, that's between School Street and Beach Street. Um, in this section of Union Street, um, we're proposing once again brand new concrete sidewalks, um, some upgrade of the lighting. Um, there will be curb realignment in front of the library. Um, that bump out will will kind of flush it out there, um, realigning the curb so that um, you know it's flush. And then this can create a few parking spaces right outside the library. Um, and then the crosswalk right there as well, right in the middle. Um, curb extensions will also be provided on the south side to shorten the pedestrian crossing. Um, the curb ramps all will be um, upgraded to meet current ADA standards. And then on the eastern end of this Union Street here, where I was talking about earlier, where um, vehicles, you know, sometimes kind of cross over to the center line, I will formalize parking just to make sure that you know they're parked um, in the in the the spaces that provides enough travel way um, for the through vehicles. <clears throat> so this kind of shows the cross section of what the existing condition on the left looks like and what it will look like um, in the proposed condition. As you can see, the bump out is gone in front of the library. Some parking spaces are available there. Um, the curb extension on the south side that's showing here will shorten the cross um, the crossing here at this um, crosswalk. And then down to Beach Street. So along Beach Street, as you can see here, um, the the the, fe the existing fencing um, will be upgraded to a decorative bridge railing. Um, new concrete sidewalk will also um, provide a grass or paper buffer um, just adjacent to the sidewalks. Um, the curb, uh, the right outside Captain Dusty, there's a um, uh, raised table that's being proposed, and this. Aside from you know increasing visibility of pedestrians, um, it also serve as a traffic calming measure to kind of lower their speeds along um, this stretch of Beach Street. And lastly, all the wheelchair, the curb ramps, um, and the crossings will all be upgraded uh, or constructed to be accessible. And then this kind of shows where um, outside of Captain Dusty on the left side is the existing condition, and then on the right side um, is the proposed um, speed. Um, Table, um, yeah, speed table that um, that we're proposing at this location here. This one is um, kind of added in afterwards. This is right outside the post office. Um, you might kind of, you know, um, not see it as well here. But on the left side is the existing condition. Um, it was kind of, you know, brought up that the space right um, right in front of that circle there. It's kind of hard to back in because of the angle of the um, the curb over there. So we had proposed to kind of cut it back a little bit um, where you can see on the right side, it's like cutting kind of half of the car there um, just to make it easier for someone to back into that spot. And then along Summer Street, some of the design elements that we've incorporated into this conceptual design, uh, conceptual plan is to upgrade the existing guardrail so that it meets current standard, and also formalize the parking spaces, um, especially, and also you know providing some wayfinding here so that you know visitors can um, can also know that there are spaces to park along this stretch of Summer Street, um, and also there are some utilities here um, that also would be good to be undergrounding these utilities. But once again, these are more of a long-term um, improvement for the utility and also require coordination as well. So it's a cross section that you can see here on the left is the existing addition. On the right side, um, as you can see, there's some street, um, ornamental street light, um, some formalized parking spots as well, the bridge railing that's been upgraded, and then um, concrete sidewalks along both sides um, to tie into the phase one project limit. 
And then that's, oops, that's it. So this is uh, what our committee has been working on, and uh, we have, after a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, working on, with our professional colleagues on, uh, on uh, uh, compromises and trade-offs that we thought were optimal, uh, we're, prepared to, we're recommending that to our elected leadership. Good. Um, the proposed lighting, is it similar to what's in town now? It is. Uh, the um, there is. It will be an updated for. There have been some technical problems that and improvements that would be identified have been identified with the uh, exact fixtures that we had before. So that will be updated, but it will be visually the same. So Ron, may I, may I speak to? A lot of them were blown out. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the intent is to provide consistent design through all the way through the town of all the design aspects of it, be it curb line, be it concrete sidewalk, be it the lighting features, being a little more consistency. And one thing that I know that is on Kurt's mind, in my mind too, we try to provide a consistent, clear path for traffic as it travels all the way from the Beverly side, Beverly farm side, all the way through the town and exiting towards, towards Gloucester. So this doesn't go narrow and wide, narrow than wide, we would create a simple painted line on the, on the side of the road so that you know where your travel lane is so you don't feel like you can wander around. Hopefully that'll control speed and give people a little better directions to how to move. It. Another thing too that uh, Steve pointed out before is that parking, parking is a little bit vague in some places here. The intent of this is also to better define the parking spaces so that we don't have the cars just parking wherever they want to. This will be a better like like widening the widening the curb at the uh, right in front of the library will now define we gained, we gained a couple spaces here and there lost one a couple here and there but we gained a few along the way so I think it'd be better for us as as, as uh, citizens and also for patrons who want to uh, frequent the uh, merchants in downtown so I think it's it's gone a long way for that and bicyclists uh, and bicyclists yeah. yeah and I think that's uh, what Gordon said putting the fog lines along the side of the road. So it defines how wide your travel lane is. Like out here in front of the restaurant across the street, the road is so wide that you, people tend to drive too fast. But if you had fog lines all the way through town, it kind of yeah. narrows, your, narrows your focus down. I got to keep between these lines. And even though there's not enough room for bicycle lanes everywhere, at least it kind of sets a little bit of a tone. That it, leave a little space. All right, I'll take Board questions, Laura. Um, yeah, there's a lot here to respond to, and I'm really glad that we're thinking about our downtown and the pedestrian and bicycle access. This plan feels to me like mostly compromise. Less, um, it could benefit from more aspiration. I think it's, it's, it's the cars and the people are sort of at a tug of war in this, and I feel that the cars are mostly winning. So, and against the pedestrians and the bicyclists. When I look back at the 2008 plans that were done. I think that's really great work. Um, you know, there's really nice materials with the granite crossings and the granite walls and granite curbing and concrete materials. So there was a lot of thought put into the materials and the kind of alignment there. Um, and so, you know, just as an example, when we're talking about nibbling away at that granite bump out to make it easier to park, mm -hmm. I don't think that's the right solution here. I think we got to put the people first if we're doing sidewalk improvements. So I heard accessibility at the curb ramps, but I didn't hear anything about accessibility of the sidewalk widths. If we're going to spend all of this money on new concrete and granite curbs, that's great. We should be doing that, but we should take that opportunity before we excavate for curbs to look at what's the right um, alignment of the road itself. And to regularize it, I think that's right, but um, let's at that same time take the opportunity to make the sidewalks wider where we can. We really can't walk two people abreast, and certainly for accessibility, I mean, I saw in a number of those photos where we're talking about not moving curbs. We've got a light pole in the way, we've got a former tree pit in the way, we've got, you know, we've got various infrastructure that necks it down so much that to get a wheelchair or a walker down um, is next to impossible. And I, I, when I look at the school, I know there was a lot of talk and a lot of opinions about the school street intersection and what happened there. And unfortunately, I feel like that was a missed opportunity because it's so wide now 
that is confusing for vehicles and it's very unsafe for pedestrians, even with the painted crosswalk. The, it's just too wide, there's no safe place, there's no sort of place of uh, refuge there for people to get out and cars go too fast around the corner before, because they can. So I applaud all the thinking you're doing. I think it's a great start, but if we're gonna put this kind of investment in our streets, let's get the alignment where it should be and let's really take a bigger look at that and preference pedestrian safety, preference bicycle infrastructure and put the curb line where it ought to be. And it's probably gonna be, you know, it's gonna make that more expensive, but if we can prioritize and say, you know, is Beach Street the most um, highest priority for this year and then continue to get grants. I think there's a lot of money out there for you know, kind of transit-oriented development, and so I think that we can, maybe with Betsy's help, get some grants. But I would just like to encourage you to push it a little more aspirationally and think a little bigger about how can we really make this a pedestrian and bike first downtown, because I think it's really, it's just a little too cautious right now, and it's not kind of dreaming big enough, so I'd love to see you um, work with a landscape architect who's done this kind of street work before, and then one more thing I'll say is I think we should be talking about Heat Island and this tree canopy. I heard you mention trees, but then I didn't really see it much in the drawings. And I know from my experience working with the Cambridge tree um, master plan that they've been doing that uh, if we're going to have healthy trees that are going to survive, we can't plant them in tree pits anymore. They have to be in either connected tree trenches, <coughs> which is expensive but ensures a long-term tree can tree plan or you know work with the friends of Manchester trees plant trees on the back side of the curb in the parklands and kind of factor them into the plan so as much as I want trees on the sidewalk I don't think just dotting them into the sidewalk is a long-term solution and it also does result in kind of necking down what are already too narrow so that's a lot I I, I um I really thank you for your work but I would encourage you to uh, let's dream a little bigger here and really make it some pedestrian first downtown. Yeah, good point. Yeah. I think some of the things you're saying, not all of them, but some of the things you're saying are kind of there. This is kind of conceptual. Like, with the sidewalks, I think those haven't really been designed, but I think that's yeah. so obviously that is very, very important. Uh, yeah, I think if you, well, somebody, I guess somebody things. made, maybe Elsa made a starting point about like we're trying not to move the curbs <laughs> and just yeah. keep with the existing alignment. So, yeah. If you're going to repave an asphalt and keep the curbs, you know, fine as an interim measure, our sidewalks are a mess. But if we're going to take the investment and really, you know, want to make this a downtown that we can be proud of, then really let's shape the street to the right kind of pedestrian environment that it ought to be. I would love to see that totally get behind that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot more we can do for bikes too, like infrastructure and uh, more clearly defined lanes and all that. Which the curbs can help with. So thank you for, for the work you're doing. Um, thank you. I think this was great. I think, um, you know, trying to get a sidewalk and a street and parking all in one, you can't, can't move the sidewalk too much because you need the cars there. So um, I just had two quick questions. Um, and obviously, it makes sense. I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it to put the utilities underground in a flood. Lane district. Does that all work? Let's see. Can it be done? Are you asking? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's safer than above ground wires and in a flood. So you, you can you can actually put wiring in underneath the water. I mean, yeah. So I guess it, just, it cost. just has to be installed appropriately. Okay. And and there is okay. um, a lot of looking at. Sorry, to, I just wanted to respond to your question, if I may. I'm sorry, I did that wrong. <laughs> Um, there is looking at overhead wires for resiliency, putting them underground because of um, trees falling on them. So a lot of communities are looking at putting their wires underground for resiliency, actually. Yeah, I mean, we have, where I live, we have, our utilities are underground, so, but I just didn't know if you could, if it made sense to do it now, knowing in a flood, it seems like. Um, then, are any of the parking sizes going to increase so I, I saw some of the pictures where you're going up um, summer well, summer and C Street mm -hmm. there um, and other areas because you you really can't fit two lanes of traffic and parking there you're going over into the, the middle lane when you're going up there um, so I'm just wondering if any within any of the plans 
our parking size is increasing so that the car can fit into no, like the traffic. I'm not exactly sure where you're speaking of. Um, so when you're going up, let's say la Laughing Gull is on your can left. Can you bring it up, Sarah? Let me see if I can. Uh, I think even in front, front of the mooring is a perfect example. Yeah, in front of the mooring is, I almost got killed oh, there. Oh, that yeah. area. Um, but it's consistent. I know it's a catch-22 that we need the parking. We don't want to get rid of a spot. Is this where you're There's talking that about last that? spot there yeah. that you always have to go. Okay. This, that's a this place area. To, to match what you're saying, that's a place where the curb lines maybe have to modify to maximize both the sidewalk. Maximize the sidewalk, but also enable whatever parking. Well, parking in front of the mooring and the Manchester by the book, that doesn't make any sense to me because it's so difficult for a biker. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mary, I was trying to respond, but I'll let you continue. Um, is that the place you were talking about? No, I think so um, in front of the mooring is one, and then if you're going up um, Summer Street, you've got Laughing Go on your right, yes, and you're going right. up by the... There's like is this in here? Zero. I can't make a... I can't find it. So you're going up, and then the old These are more left. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. winding up the hill there. Correct. Okay. There's parking spots there, yeah. and I I always laugh a little because it's there's no way I can go up, a car could be parked, and a car could come down. Like, somebody's got to pause, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering if, if within this plan, everything's staying the same size, or um, are we going to try to accommodate that we aren't going into the oncoming traffic? To get around the parked cars, as you do in front well, of the mooring. I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, which happens in front of the mooring, right? Like yeah. that little the curb. The mooring is. Yeah, yeah, so awkward. unfortunately, we'd either have to get rid of a parking spot or rejigger it somehow. So I just didn't know if that was in these plans. That was my question. I, I just uh, Elsa, are you still on the line? I am. Yeah, so with regards to like Summer Street, you know, there's actually existing parking out there already. Um, so we're just kind of, you know, putting parking spaces just to formalize that. So it's not really changing, you know, the width of the road or anything or the travel lane. Um, you know, everywhere that we're trying to, you know, achieve is to have 11 foot travel lanes um, uh, along the, 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 the roadway there. So. But in no time are we going to reduce the the width of the travel lanes below effective design criteria. Correct. Yeah. So we want to make sure that you know there's minimum width. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly how to answer your question. Yeah, and I just, we'll certainly look at it. Yeah, and I you know maybe nothing can be done, but I see it on School Street, Lower School Street, where we have a parking lane, but a car can't actually fit there. So they're over the line when they're parked. Yeah. So that means the car coming down can't fit if a car is coming up, right? right? So it just creates all these little pockets in town that get risky. So, so noted. <laughs> Thank she you. certainly heard the question. <laughs> Thank you. We, we call that character in magic. I know, well it is. It's a what? Character. I didn't hear your question. Character. Character. <laughs> so no, I call it really dangerous, and I've asked this question over and over again. So if we're spending this money and we're doing it, we're keeping the situation dangerous. So. I mean, I have to travel down School Street all the time. So I think if there's not enough for a car parked and someone to travel on a main thoroughfare in town, we need to eliminate the parking. It's not safe. Like, specifically School Street. We just paid a ton of money. People, It looks ridiculous that cars are parked over the line and you need to go into opposing traffic. I've sent several emails. We can, take, we can take School Street on a different time, but the fact is that the bylaw is what allows people to park in this town, not the lines. So that's what needs to be addressed. But I don't, correct. That's... I understand, but my point is, if we have a consultant, and I'm assuming we paid the consultant some good money, why are we not talking about where the car can physically park and a car can pass and three things can happen at once? Like I don't I think see we that. Can, I think we can address this on Summer Street. Like it's certainly, it's in certainly a, within the context of what we're doing. Correct, but I didn't see this addressed on Central Street in front of the mooring. Well, it was uh, discussed. It wasn't. It wasn't a finalized design. So no, I think no, what you're seeing is the, the concept of what our our design intent is going to be: a finite, detailed planning, actual dimensions, actual need to move a curb mm -hmm. line, spans, whatever. It is still yet to be happened. 
So we'll certainly address But that. I think the idea of losing a parking spot is like would create havoc, right? So that's are we ignoring <laughs> that conversation or are we just Oh no 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 no, no quite not. And the other thing is I think the lines, while they might be, you know, following some industry standard, School Street looks like Cambridge right now to me. It doesn't look like a small historic town. So putting that all throughout the downtown, I don't know if there's different colors, if you can use like silver reflective but the white to me you lose the town charm mm -hmm. um and back to pine and central can we pull up that slide yeah, yeah we just mentioned that school street is not anything that we've been involved with well this so the pictures look similar i mean that's what i'm saying so is it possible then to redefine the curbs at the gas station because i think that's a big like as a town, we're in charge of curb cuts and curbing. Can we redefine the gas station so you can't just open and you know enter and leave at any? Are you yeah. talking about the former Richdales or are you talking no. about the Pine? No. Pine and Central. And Pine. That that is that is that is a separate project from from this. I mean, we're well aware of the issues at Central and, and, and Pine Street. Uh, we have I have I have scars on my back from working with what was attempted uh, mm. under complete streets at that corner and finally right. dropped. Uh, I think that on that particular corner, uh, we need to get some, some buy-in and consensus from the abutters uh, as, a, as, as we move forward because that, that, has been, that, is, that has been a challenge. We made, a, as a committee, we made a considered decision to separate that issue from what we're showing you tonight. Just I think it's just one property on the gas station, correct? Are you going to make it one way or something? Well, no, there's all, no, no, there's no. All my, curbing. my point at the gas station, there's no curbing. There's no way in and way out. You can kind of go anywhere. So if you're coming either way and someone's leaving the gas station, you don't know where they're going because there's nowhere to indicate where they're coming in and out. That's my point. And so could you pull up that intersection? Because at that particular point, there's nowhere to cross and go towards Tuck's Point. It only assumes that you're going downtown. I don't. I think um, it was one of the first. The no, it was, and in, it was the in the other. It was in. Uh, uh, it was in Elsa's. Elsa's. Um, what it might look like. Pull up that slide if she's still there. Yeah, she's still there. Sure, I can do that. I think it was like the first intersection, if I'm wrong. Yeah. I would jump and say I wholeheartedly agree with you. I live right there, and I can see it out my window of my house so I see all I hear all the cars going through there. And definitely that is it's not something that we've done as part of this, but that is on the table that we want to by the time we do Im any implementation that this is part of the implementation because that's one of the worst intersections we've got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is. Me right. here? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Outside your no. spell yeah, yeah, the yeah, oh, yeah, okay. But you, there was a slide that showed the sidewalks. Maybe it's the next one then? No, I think it actually. Yeah, that's it. That one. This one. So I think if I'm not, if I'm correct, the gas station is like to the left, that yes. whitish. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this doesn't allow anyone to come down Pine and go left, or and then to go right towards Beverly. You mean a pedestrian or a car? Or a pedestrian. pedestrian. So this is something yeah, that we are true. anticipating working on on a different, uh, a different design for the intersection itself. So what's shown here is the improvements that we would make to the sidewalks and curbing to you know continue the look and feel as was discussed, and then the actual turning movements and pedestrian movements within the intersection need to be vetted out against actual traffic counts, actual peak rates, you know, morning peak, afternoon peak, things like that. So that, that's part of a separate scope which wasn't included in this initial study. And so that's why we haven't shown any improvements on the corner with the um, with the gas station. Wasn't there a rotary there once? Temporarily? That, that, was that, was that goes back to the Complete Streets project. Oh. And we had several different things that were, were tried, none of which worked or were well received well good acceptance from the community 
Um, so we're back to square one in terms of, of addressing that intersection, which again, I emphasize, as Chuck said, is a separate project from what we're looking at tonight. I guess then my final concern would be just, you know, putting in these lines and not considering the flow of traffic and crossing the line. That to me is, so I don't see, and follow up on Laura with the trees, I mean, my street was never maintained. Is there a budget for maintaining trees if you're doing this? Because the trees weren't maintained, the trees have to come down and it's not quaint historic anymore because the mature trees and then the sidewalks are damaged. So I guess, where is the traffic and the lines and the distance being addressed? At what phase of this project? It's from the very beginning. When you when you talk about the traffic, we're not doing the Pine Street intersection, as we just discussed, but the traffic all the way through the town, all the way up to Washington Street, is being addressed. So you're eliminating spaces in front of the mooring? We haven't. We haven't. No, we're not eliminating as of yet. We're still working on the details of that. But the consultant, is she finished? Is she going to come back with phase three? She could, we, we could, she could show you that. Elsa, could you show the parking in front of the mooring? Where's the big freight right there? Right there. Is that it? Yes. Like three spots, four spots? Sometimes five spots, I think. So you stop at least four. four. Yeah. So this is a conceptual level design that we have yeah. evaluated a few different alternatives within the context of the you know area that was shown. The next step would be to go to a actual design where we would incorporate full roadway survey of all the area. And there might be some instances where things need to be a little tweak here and there to shuffle, but in general, the concepts are as what's shown. If, if we can keep the parking at the morning, that is certainly the goal of the project. If the project has to remove the parking at the morning, then that will happen at that time. But it's premature for us to do it. As shown there on that screen, there's two 11 foot lanes with the parking. So there's no need to show it removed right now. But once we get the final design with the actual surveyed layouts, then there might be some tweaking that needs to be done. So we shouldn't get into the details on 11 foot lanes and parking here and there. The general concept is what's important right now, and we will be back with additional work as we can complete it. So I think that's what needs to be taken away here. So we're just looking at aesthetics. Is that so? Um, is that we're not really looking at safety? Is that what? No, no. Clearly, we're, clearly, clearly, we safety. are looking at safety, and we think that we can accommodate both safety and the layout yeah. as what is desired by both the business owners of the downtown and the community within the downtown. If something has to compromise, it will be at a later time. So is the yellow lines, is that what would be on the street? Is that it? I guess I'm not sure. The yellow lines oh. are less okay. So the, the middle, the, these are the center lines of the roadway. I don't know if you actually see the point, but um, the double yellow, like right in the middle of the center line, and then um, the, the kind of muted yellow, um, that's the sidewalk, the proposed okay. sidewalks. Are there any flashing lights proposed with this project? Currently, there are no flashing light proposed um, for the any of these locations. Okay. But once again, as Chuck mentioned, you know that's something that you can kind of flush out later on in the design. And, um, but right now, there's um, there there are no plans on the flashing crossing signs. Laura. I'm taking issue with the with the starting point that the goal is to preserve parking and only tweak. So I think we have to ask ourselves some hard questions as a town to say, what do we want? Do we want a historic looking, gracious, walkable downtown that kind of echoes with you know large the large trees and the walking side by side, or do we want a town that's convenient for parking at the expense of pedestrians? So we're going to nibble away at pop outs that we put before, we're going to make our crosswalks wider to the point where they don't feel safe to cross. And, you know, I look at the parking outside the mooring and I think it's dangerous. It's the wrong place for parking. It's too narrow there. 
And if we just, if the starting point is we got to preserve every space and we're only going to tweak, and then what we're going to get is a compromise that doesn't really make anybody happy. So it's not wide enough to walk on the sidewalks. You can't walk side by side. You can't push a walker down the sidewalk. And yet you're, you're sort of doing a kind there of halfway. There just isn't enough space to do everything that everyone likes to do. I agree. Person. So I think we have to say, sure. do we need a parking space? Maybe we should have some options that say, if we want to look at a wider sidewalk, then we might need to remove a few parking spaces. But let's do the study so that we can see what the choices are rather than saying we're going to compromise and try to fit everything that's in there now. The parking is not historic to the downtown. So let's just make this what do we want it to be, not just like let's try to you know please as many people and end up with a compromise solution. So I'm just taking issue with the starting goal, which is don't eliminate any parking spaces. I think we should look hard at how the downtown should be aligned in, in the curve and the lanes. Sarah. I don't. I don't want to go back and forth, uh, Laura. I, you know, generally agree with what you're saying, but I would love to have a conversation with you offline about this in terms of other areas as well, when you have a chance. That's great. Um, well, you've taken on a uh, a challenging <laughs> project, and I appreciate all of your hard work. Um, and the reason I know that it was planning board. Phase one was a planning board project because I was on the planning board and then I was on the downtown improvement committee before it actually implemented anything. And so I've heard these arguments are 20 years old um, or these challenges, these compromises. So it, I don't have the solution. Um, and um, so, um, so I guess my point in saying that is... Uh, no matter what solution comes, there will be critics and they will be loud. So be courageous and uh, set your design goals and work to, you know, get near perfect, recognizing it's going to be hard. Um, so I appreciate all your, you know, your willingness to, to take it on because you're trying to fit a, a round peg in a square hole or whatever it is. Um, but a couple other thoughts. Uh, the bump out in front of the post office was very deliberately, de hotly debated, widely criticized, and was done because people felt that, that, that pedestrians couldn't be seen as you came from the beach, as they stepped off the, that curb. So you've got a great engine. VHB is well known as an engineering firm. So before that one gets uh, too much traction, really think about, you know, people prior to that bump out, you guys, many of you lived in town, you know, people were hit there as they stepped off that curb. Um, so that... Uh, so you're suggesting, Sarah, that we leave the bump keep out. the bump out as is? Yes, absolutely. And there are plenty of places to people who can't, don't know how to back up their car to park other places. You park up on Summer Street. Um, so that's just that that piece of history, for whatever it's worth, that particular bump out on both sides by the post office was just hotly contributed, you know, and widely widely criticized. But um, for whatever that's worth, um, the other uh, thing um, that I just wanted to raise is is some I bike a lot. Is there a way to actually? safely direct cyclists, not kids, but, you know, cyclists to actually bike from the pines, the intersection we were just talking about, through to uh, the track, say, uh, drive, bike in the middle as traffic. Because that's how I ride it. I ride in the middle of the... But to, to encourage that, it slows down traffic. People don't need to go faster than I can bike, which isn't very fast. Um, but, I, and you guys know... Your, you know, VHB and others know that, but how do you get people to actually be the cyclists to be part of the solution? And the other thing is, there are cyclists who, you know, pass me on the right when I'm driving a car. So, you know, let's get some enforcement on cyclists too. That's that's you know, it's a it's a it's a system, and I don't think cyclists are entirely without fault in the safety of them. Um, so, and I would encourage our our enforcement people to enforce the speed limits for cyclists and the safety and the stopping at stop signs. Um, the other thing is I stood out holding signs one time <laughs> at that stop sign in front of, this is ghost enforcement, but the, um, uh, including Manchester police, uh, that 
we, we all said that stop sign is optional. Which one? The one by the police by the post office coming from Beach Street toward. Uh, so we should we just had need to we need to couple this with as a, a cross that's not your charge but to the extent that we are inclu including enforcement for speed and for stopping um, so whatever the other last thing um, I was just going to point out two well two two last things sorry one is that we have this other problem that I think we haven't talked about which is the large delivery trucks that come through town um, and the intersection by the mooring. Uh, Union and Washington Street by the old Zacks, um, as well as, you know, large uh, boat trailers. And um, I mean, we have a lot of boat trailers that go through that intersection and a lot of trailers, a lot of deliveries going to Crosby's, which I think gives us an additional challenge there and maybe hours of restrict access through that intersection by certain sized things at, um, uh, you know, trailers and tractor trailers or restrict the parking during the hours that the large deliveries come through that intersection. I don't know. Some sort of creative, I think you have to acknowledge that we have um, a, some very large vehicles that go through that intersection. Um, and if you're driving a boat trailer through there, you are well over the line onto the you know, by Cargo Unlimited, if you're coming from going toward the beach, it's impossible to drive. So, you know, maybe it's restricted during certain times. It's not unheard of in other places. It might help solve to some some of the problems. Um, and then lastly, because we're the planning board, I think it would be very helpful as you develop uh, further, develop your goals and your design standards that we work them into uh, zoning so that um, as people change a use or, or change, a, you know, come for a building permit or um, uh, a variance or um, a, that they are required to adhere to the design standards in front of their property to return them to uh, when they make a curb cut or a um, utility access that they are required with maybe a, a performance guarantee um, for um, in making sure that the, they're returned to the um, to the appropriate design standards. Because I think some of the uh, things you mentioned in your um, slideshow have evolved because of utility access or um, other kinds of things. So um, you know, I think uh, be courageous and and as you move in from the concept stage into it, as, as Chuck um, said, into a actual design, I have confidence that you'll balance all these things wonderfully. Sarah, can I ask a question? Yes. So as far as far as, as far as planning board requirements and zoning criteria here, you're not referring to storefront design or signage size or, or signage type or font or anything. That, Those that, could be zoned. And we have signage, we have sign requirements, which I, you know, historic we have yeah, historic sign. district yeah. um, so requirements. There are limitations as to what can be put up there. It's, it's there um, are some signs, uh, uh, size of signs and that kind of thing. Lit okay. signs are restricted. There's the historic district requirements. But, but those are, op there are um, opportunities to use zoning Zoning only applies to things that are taking out a permit. They don't re apply retroactively. Um, but, uh, you know, looking forward, we are undertaking thoughts about zoning in that whole area with the MBTA zoning um, task force. I think that this is this could be um, part of those, de you know, design standards um, could be yeah. part of that. Is the state move? Does any state standards apply to the town? Uh, road standards? Did you hear that? Did you hear that, uh, Chuck? Is he still on? I don't know the answer to that, Ron, but Chuck would better you know. You mean the previous? You have yeah, to get a yeah, he is. He's on now. Yeah. No, if you're on a state road. Is it I'm a sure VHP knows that. Until is it a state to road through town or is it town jurisdiction? Sorry, I missed. I missed the question. What was the question again? Uh, Chuck, it's a state road, right? One twenty. It's a state route through town. One twenty-seven is 
but we had town jurisdiction from Ashland to C Street, basically. Does that answer the question? Or? Yeah, that works. Okay, so I, 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 I go, go ahead, Chris. So um, I think it's interesting that the, the entrance to the town from both Gloucester and from Beverly starts with terrible intersections. Uh, so we have Bennett Street and Pine Street on one end and C Street and Washington Street on the other. Is there any attempt to restart the, some sort of a design work for the C Street intersection? I know there was a lot of controversy about it. Well, we, we, we took a run at it uh, with the Complete Speech Project and there was so much controversy at both ends about anything that was proposed that we severed that from this project, and but that does not mean that we're not cognizant of that. We certainly intend to undertake those in the not too distant future as separate projects and see if we can reach some consensus on that. But those turned out to be very, very thorny issues. Yeah, it's interesting because if, if you propose the, the current layouts to the, the we're a clean slate, and you propose those layouts to the abutters. I don't think that would be the worst possible design you could come up with. So, so it's just, I don't know whether it's worth another shot to sit down with the abutters and see if there can well, be I, a solution. I, you know, I mean, my, my impression or my sense is that, that um, well, everyone had the best of intentions with, with uh, uh, complete streets. I think we found ourselves... Um, with a state program that sort of was, was based on some generalized standards, which then were attempted to, in order to, uh, to, part to participate in that program, they had to be imposed upon very irregular intersections that, that were not typical kinds of things that those typical standards were imposed upon. And every time we, we although we all tried our best to produce uh, an improvement on at least sort of traditional traffic engineering standards. Um, they were so upsetting to abutters and people who were traveling through them. I remember spending time taking car counts down at the, at the, uh, at the uh, uh, roundabout uh, at Central and Pine to see how many people would even obey it on a, on a trial basis. And it was just, you know, there was not even a willingness to, to try to obey the, the temporary thing. Plus, various abutters uh, disliked that. So, um, what I think, uh, you know, to try to do it the other way, uh, my sense is if we can convene the abutters to have some, to, and, see, and brainstorm with the abutters and see if there was some kind of, uh, consensus around that and then work out from that just to try a completely different approach mm -hmm. um, but as a discrete thing separate from this project sure, yeah, of course. Um, so those two things are on our schedule things to do we've been so preoccupied with this particular project that that we haven't had much bandwidth to work to work with on those other matters, but we haven't forgotten them by any means. Would you guys care to add anything to that? I know you. I was going to say on the specifically on the Pine Street intersection, there were other options available other than the roundabout. One of them, I think, would be something to use as a starting point for a discussion that would that's probably pretty close to maybe the optimal solution, maybe not the optimal solution, but it's it's something we can work off from to uh, to have a conversation with all the others. Yeah, that's great. Uh, well, I have one final point, which is to reiterate what Sarah said about piggybacking on the MBTA zoning um, program that we're going through uh, to tr make sure we're coordinated. So you're not doing something that's going to have to be changed when somebody wants to build a residential unit somewhere. So. You're the liaison to the board. Yes, luckily, yeah, luckily I am. Chair, so, so noted. We have one of our members on on that. And Gar is a Gar is an outspoken person, as we all know. So, so we should also say that the, the signage and wayfinding is also will be coordinated with us too. We're not yes. we're not going to be acting alone. This will be a 
a well thought out entire program. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for Elsa. So Elsa, are you still on? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. So I guess my question is, um, hopefully you can answer it. What is there an industry standard for two lanes of traffic in opposing directions and parking with and could you can you cite that somewhere? And yeah, I guess, so you know, in, in general you want to have like eleven foot travel lanes. Um oh, sorry, it's a little distracting looking at myself, like large screen here. Um you know, eleven foot travel lanes is what we have. Um and then parking, you know, generally we have eight foot minimum parking. Um, we don't want to go anything, you know, less than 11 foot lanes um, as far as travel so that, you know, people go, when there's an emergency, people can bypass um, and there's a, you know, when there's emergency, the, the emergency vehicles can bypass and stuff. So, so as far as, you know, kind of back to your question of, you know, fitting everything um, within the existing and also providing, you know, enough, you know, width for sidewalks and stuff, you know, that's, um that's the minimum that we that we would have to kind of abide by. So I guess just to follow up with Laura, like I feel if you once you do the specifics here and there isn't these measurements, I mean my expectation with the next phase is that those parking spaces would be eliminated. Like there really shouldn't be any more conversation. If there isn't enough road for two lanes for two lanes of traffic and parking, the parking spaces need to be eliminated. Safety is number one. Um, it's it's just getting pretty dangerous. A lot of visitors People that are familiar with the town, maybe off season, people can navigate these roads without, you know, too much concern. But especially in the summer, when out of town people are visiting the beach, that's the direct route to the beach. It, it gets very, very dangerous. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you, Steve Thank and you. Kurt and Gordon for coming. You're very welcome. Hopefully you can come back to us again and keep us informed as of to how you develop. Um, Absolutely. We'll be happy to have you back for the board. Yep. And in the new spirit of keeping all the boards and committees yes. together, I mean, right. Ron and I talk much much more frequently than we used to, and we'll continue to do so. Great. Great. And Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, hopefully these comments will take, yeah. we'll take yeah. these yeah. comments from the board. Thank you. Sure. Ran a stop. <laughs> So up next is the civil space, civic space, civic space committee. Uh, Daniel Koff, are you on? Yes, I am here. Hello, everyone. Okay, and uh, you have a presentation, I assume. Yes, we do. And it looks like I have uh, screen capabilities, which is great. Uh, so, cool. let me share my screen. And get that. Oh. Okay, you should have oh. it now. Great. Do you want to introduce this or do you have this is we keep seeing this? Yeah, so Civic Space Collaborative um, was um, a consultant who was hired before I came on board. Um, this was a grant. Um, with the Mass Downtown Initiative Program. And um, they also came in and did worked with Tiffany on Skating by the Sea. That was another grant. Um, but this one was specifically on placemaking um, in the town center. So, um, and Daniel and Claudia were, were both involved in this. Take it away, Daniel. All right. Well, thank you, Betsy, uh, for the intro and also for introducing us to so many wonderful people in Manchester uh, and for helping to coordinate feedback as we were generating, as we were assessing the existing conditions and generating ideas. And also, thank you to the folks in the, from the Downtown Improvement Committee that I saw um, in the meeting. Uh, there, we met with them five times over the course of this project, so their input was really helpful, as well as uh, members from the Bike and Ped Committee, the Historic District Commission, uh, the Historical Museum, and I'm not forgetting anyone, but um, we 
realize that um, we have not, oh, and the select board as well, we've met with throughout this project, uh, at least once during this project, but we have not met with the planning board yet, so we're I'm excited to share the results with you tonight. Um, and just want to let you know, you know, we've heard some preliminary feedback from folks on the planning board noticing that um, although we haven't met with you yet, you're in the acknowledgments. And I just want to let you know by the end of this presentation, if you want us to remove the planning board from the, the plan, we're open to sending you another version. Um, or if there are any other edits like that uh, by the end of this, you know, that you see that you'd like us to recommend to make, we're happy to do that at this time. Um, Can I just ask you to recommend to whom? Did, you said to recommend to, so who's the audience of your recommendations? The, our, the recommendations are for the town, which, yeah, which includes you. So this is, um, this plan was, as Betsy said, came out of a competitive application to the Community One Stop for Growth Mass Downtown Initiative. And this was a sick result of the six month process um, to create a holistic placemaking plan. This was one of the recommendations that came out of the Essex Manchester Local Rapid Recovery Program in 2021. So this follows up on that LR LRP program. Um, and it's meant to create um, a holistic to think holistically about downtown and to select up to four different placemaking components that could be conceived of together um, as a holistic package to improve placemaking, to and activate. I, I um, believe you actually did a presentation in last December. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To the planning board. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you did. All right. Okay. Thanks for jogging my memory. And there were comments at that time because you were doing, um, or it might have been a little later because around the time of the survey. Yeah, it was around the time of the survey, skating by the skating by the sea survey. So it might have been a yeah. little later than that. Maybe it was March. Okay, that was to I I thought that was to the um, board of selectmen, but well, there was one to the board of selectmen, and there was also one to the planning board. I believe. Okay. okay. So um, you have presented to this board before. Okay. Great. Thanks for clarifying. Um, so hopefully this, all of this, won't be too much of a surprise. Um, and uh, we can get we can dive into the details. So the local rapid recovery program had. Um, established boundaries for that program that were slightly altered for this placemaking plan to focus more on the walkable parts of downtown. So the LRP extended all the way around the Inner Harbor. We decided to cut it uh, off to the more walkable parts, focusing more on this downtown core and extending up to Elm Street to connect to the conservation land. Um, since one of downtown Manchester's core strengths is its uh, accessibility to wonderful open spaces nearby. Um, also, it includes Maskinoma Park and Reed Park, um, which are outside the boundaries of the historic district. So working with the um, Downtown Improvement Committee, um, we, were, we selected four different projects to focus on. So they are um, streetscape furniture, uh, wayfinding, public art, and public restrooms. And so I'll go through each one showing you what we learned and what we're recommending to shift. So starting with streetscape furniture and specifically benches, as you can see from this map of existing benches, there are quite a few in downtown. Um, and so we did not feel the need to recommend too many more, um, except to, re to make sure that your downtown is kind of reading uh, cohesively. So 
for example, at the time when we were making these maps, I believe this may have changed already, but there were four benches along the inner harbor here that were past their um, life, their their life, and I believe they've been replaced by new teak benches, which is great because that's, that was one of our recommendations. Um, also, there are some tired benches in Reed Park as well that could use some updating. And the only new benches we're picking that really could be added was in this uh, potential future pocket park adjacent to the mechanics lot. Um, would be a nice site for pocket park and for seating and enjoying it. As you'll see um, from the different shapes, the square are these memorial benches, and there are quite a few in specific areas. So looking at your existing and proposed, we have three notice, not counting the tired benches that we're suggesting that you replace um, that have a concrete base and wooden um, supports. You have these new teak benches, um, a few metal benches um, with a memorial plaque, and then these memorial granite benches. And for the new benches that are especially going to be in a kind of new area, we're recommending a different style um, that would be kind of more aligned with um, the a traditional bench with a cast iron support, but would still have um, a wooden uh, wooden slats that will be cool to the touch in the summer, and um, that will yeah, and that will be nice in the that won't be too cold in the winter and won't be too hot in the summer. And we recommended. Um, since you have an overabundance of these granite benches, especially around um, Reed Park, we're recommending that you kind of sunset that granite bench memorial program. Those benches will last for eternity, which is great, but they're also, as you may notice, not super comfortable uh, to sit on. And so we're suggesting a more functional bench um, moving forward, but that you continue this this memorial program has been a huge success, as you see from the wide variety of benches that we've been able to install. All right, so moving on to tables, which is the flip side. There are very few tables to sit at downtown, and that was one of the things that we noticed is um, there's not very many places where you could grab a bite to eat downtown and then bring it to public park and enjoy. There are a few um, kind of traditional style picnic benches in Masconoma Park, and we're recommending new tables in Reed Park, um, potentially some in this pocket park, and um, also in this area by the landing, uh, the town, yeah, the, the town landing, which we think could be a nice, and also a nice little parklet area with this inner harbor improved. Um, there are also, I should note, some lovely benches and tables and just wonderful collection of streetscape furniture at the library. I would say this is a great example of how um, a kind of cohesive collection of furniture thoughtfully placed and created wonderful space. So the, this is a picture of the table set at the library, wayfinding signs around it's really a lovely place. Uh, example of the traditional style table at Masconoma Park that doesn't have too much um, excitement going on with it, but serves its purpose. Um, and we're recommending, especially in Reed Park, this uh, more stable set of furniture that will be really comfortable. We'll have a back, um, which will be comfortable for people of all ages. Uh, and it can also, the table pops can also come with, um, you know, chess tables, et cetera, to provide more activity. Would that be on grass or on pavement? Um, so we're thinking that in Reed Park specifically, that you would put a pad of, um, of like brick down and it would sit on the on the brick similar to this. And so not being on grass like this one. 
Um, we also looked at trash receptacles. There are a few existing of various forms. Um, and so we're recommending this could be a good way to create more consistency downtown is to create a, a more consistent selection of them and to make sure that they're scattered um, around places where people are going to be walking. Um, and so we have it one down by this pedestrian uh, pathway, again, by the town landing. I um, think you could have one adjacent to the town hall, the new pocket park, and along Beach Street. So the existing trash receptacles, as I was mentioning, are um, there are different varieties. You know, you have this a new nice one. We're recommending you can stick with it, go with it, um, but get a rain bonnet, which will keep the rain away from getting inside the the liner, and it will also keep seagulls away um, versus this kind of trash can, which may serve a functional purpose, but um, doesn't kind of hold, I think, portray downtown in the way that you may want it to. Um, bike racks. The Bike and Peg Committee has done a wonderful job of installing bike corrals throughout um, downtown, and we're proposing that for the, as the next step, you consider bike posts that can go on the street. So this is an example of a bike corral that does multiple, um, you know, they can't fit on your narrow sidewalk. So we're recommending this kind of style, which can go on, um, can be attached to parking meters if you do move in that direction, or they can just stand alone. And these kind of um, bike racks can have a custom logo inside. So when we get to wayfinding, we'll talk about how you could develop a, a new kind of brand for the town that could be unfolded across your wayfinding and also some of your streetscape furniture. So moving to wayfinding, um, what we found is that um, the that there are quite a few signs um, spe specifically for business directories that are on the street. There's a lot of vehicular signage, but the, the signage for uh, pedestrians is somewhat lacking. Um, that said, there are there's a lot going on in Manchester. It's, it's a beautiful town, and, and I don't think you want to kind of create visual clutter with too many additional pedestrian signs. So we're recommending that you focus on um, mostly on developing a custom kiosk for Manchester that could be installed in any one of um, these kind of key locations as people get off their boats, they can become oriented at, at the kiosk as folks um, are over here, same thing, right in the heart of downtown. Um, so the kiosk can serve multiple purpose. They can have a map and provide orientation. They can um, promote local businesses. They can have current events. The right now this fence serves kind of dual purpose of being a kind of signage area for the town to promote local community events, and we think that could be formalized potentially with a kiosk. Um, there's also room for some pedestrian signs specifically to be improved, specifically around to encourage people to use the pedestrian walkway um, going connecting from Beach Street to the municipal lot. Um, and that could be folded into the kiosk RFP uh, in the future. So an example of some of the visual clutter that you see, um, you know, the MBTA, uh, local business signs, and then this sign for the uh, pedestrian sign can kind of get lost. Um, a lot of business signs. So we're recommending that for these pedestrian, these temporary signs, it's a great pilot project. Um, and we're thinking that you could move forward with that on something more of a permanent basis with a, a more robust post and more permanent uh, 
directional arrow signage to encourage people to use that pathway. And then for the kiosks, there's a few different models. You know, there's a multi-sided kiosk, um, or you can do a double-sided kiosk. There's kiosks that unfold. So that's something I think if you hired a wayfinding designer, if you put an RFP together, um, you'd be able to get someone who could walk you through those options and come up with something that I think would be really great for the town and help pedestrians um, navigate through space and learn about the history. All right, so moving on to public art, speaking of the history of the town, um, in our assessment of the existing public art, we've found that there, there are some wonderful pieces like this mural, um, but all the artwork downtown is, of a, is commemorative in nature. Uh, even this one, which celebrates the um, founders of Brown's Market. It's nothing wrong with commemorative art, but I think art can serve other purposes. And that's something that we talk about in the plan. Uh, so looking at your existing artwork, um, you have commemorative works, which we're calling the mural, the new um, veterans memorial. There's another veterans memorial here, and also lovely statue, which is and began the Veterans Memorial. So thinking more broadly about public art, um, it can help create um, more of a sense of place downtown. It can create more safety, uh, encourage more pedestrian behavior, and it, it can also propose new futures. And so we'll, we'll talk about those. But just real quick, um, I show you what we're talking about and we can talk about where they are. So the existing Chief Masconomo statue, uh, we have the Veterans Memorials and Mural like Crosby's as your existing artwork. And in the future, we're proposing that um, you think about more murals, uh, specifically on at least one more side of Crosby. Uh, Crosby's uh, sidewalk gallery along the pedestrian walkway, painted electrical boxes, a creative crosswalk, and temporary sculptures. So I can show you where those would be. So we, along the pedestrian walkway, um, there's this fence here that could be a great place for a sidewalk gallery of banners. So on that artwork, you could promote the work of local artists. You could have an annual call for art for school children that could be printed on banners and posted along that gallery as a way to bring people to the space and encourage visitors to use it. There's also some really great blank walls along this uh, pedestrian walkway that could be painted with murals. Other murals along Crosby's, specifically this wall here on the uh, eastern side, I think um, if you walk around this space because of the setbacks of these buildings with the parking in front, it creates a really open environment and I think a mural here would create more of a container for the street and um, establish more of a sense of place in summer and kind of fold it more into the downtown core. Um, let's see, we are Banners, sculpture, creative crosswalk. Um, this is one that if I think would be really fun. Um, this is some, something that got a lot of great feedback when we were tabling in Masconoma Park during the Skate by the Sea event. Having a creative crosswalk connecting Masco to Captain Dusty's would be really fun for kids. Um, it would also signal to drivers to slow down in this area. And it could also propose new futures. This is something, this is an installation you could do for relatively cheap. And it could be done before, um, in anticipation of in implementing some of the findings from the VHB study. I know they were talking about potentially having a, a, a traffic hump, a raised um, crosswalk here. You know, painting the crosswalk could be a way to signal to folks down tap in town that changes are coming and to you know be prepared for that and it could be some 
something that could be repainted once um, the new streetscape is realigned. And then sculpture. There's great opportunity for temporary sculpture that can be um, in these parks to encourage people to go downtown. Sculptures can propose new futures. I know you're thinking about the MBTA study. You're doing <coughs> a lot of thinking about climate change. And artwork can be a way to talk about these issues in a way that's not so loaded and um, uh, in a way that can be kind of fun and playful. And so I think it's something to think about um, moving forward. This is an example of a temporary sculpture. These pieces last one to five years. They're made by local Massachusetts artists. Um, there's one in Lowell being made right now from our myth makers. And lastly, public restrooms. I know you all have, um, put a lot of thought into public restrooms uh, and heard a lot about how in building out more restrooms could be a way to create more of a welcoming space for visitors. And so um, we walked downtown with Jim Brown, um, an owner of a lot of these buildings who, who knows, um, has a very intimate knowledge of the restroom situation. And we found that restrooms in local businesses is limited um, for a variety of reasons and that relying on local businesses to provide public accommodation is not really feasible. So it's kind of up to the, the public here to um, the municipality to provide those resources. So there is a restroom at the library and recently found out there is one at town hall that is now open 24 seven um, thanks to a realignment. Um, if you go through the police station, I believe you can access it. So that's wonderful, but it's not widely known, especially for people who are getting off the train and going to Singing Beach. So we considered restrooms at um, all of these different locations, and we're recommending that you consider installing new facilities in um, these two, and these two locations, one by the sewer division and one at Masconoma Park adjacent to Beach Street. And the different conditions in these areas, I think, present different opportunities to invest in different kinds of facilities. So I can take you through those, um, those two options. So the options are kind of customized off the shelf or a custom facility. And I um, heard from a lot of people that if there's going to be something on Beach Street that's going to be part of downtown, you want it to be beautiful, you want it to be representative of the town, you want it to be custom, which is completely understandable. There's a great example for, um, in Concord that may be a little bit more than what you would need in Manchester, um, but you do have a model uh, that's pre-existing of the historic bathhouse from Singing Beach. You could hire an architect to create a custom design um, that would that would call attention to this history, um, which I, we think would be wonderful for this Beach Street area. Um, there was a study two years ago conducted about restroom facilities, looking at Reed Park um, and Masconoma Park specifically this area, looking at connections to utilities. Um, permitting issues, et cetera. And so um, we address those more in the plan. You can read more, but essentially having a restroom here would be a, would enable the town to tap into existing utilities on Beach Street, um, which would be a plus. And also having a restroom adjacent to the sewer division would also enable you to tap into existing utilities. Because the, the, and we considered these different locations also attracting different audiences. So obviously this would attract visitors going to Beach Street. A restroom here could also serve as folks who are at Masconoma Park in any number of the um, events over the summer and winter. 
whereas a restroom over here could service voters and people in the municipal lot. So here you might have a kind of flood of people coming in at one time to use the facility, whereas here we're imagining it might be, you know, one or two people going to their car or coming off their boat, so a smaller facility could be used here. And we're thinking for the facility by the sewer division, because the sewer division is already a cinder block building, tucked away from downtown, not on your core uh, area, and I believe it's outside the historic district, um, you could think about installing one that's off the shelf. Something off the shelf like this, um, we included a quote in the, uh, in the appendix of the meeting plan. You're welcome to look at it. There's a lot of different options for ways to customize um, the facade and the interiors. And this would cost less than half of what a custom facility would cost and would also be um, flood resistant in that if this uh, were to flood, the structure would remain intact and you could refit it with new modular um, components. So it would be pretty robust and climate resilient. So as far as next steps, an overview, um, you know, I think you're already ahead of the game with some of the streetscape furniture recommendations. We recommended installing the four outdated ones at Masco Park. I believe those have already been replaced with new teak benches, which is great. The next step would be to do the same thing at Reed Park um, and to think about instead of the teak benches, maybe going with the Victor Stanley bench, something that um, has a cast iron support, more traditional feel. Um, thinking about installing new trash receptacles with rain bonnets would make the downtown more welcoming. Um, and installing bike racks on the street would be also more welcoming to, um, to bikers, so they don't have to kind of bike into a back area to, to find a corral. In terms of wayfinding, the next step there would be to create an RFP to hire a designer to develop a custom brand for the town, out of which could unfold the kiosk, um, directionals for pedestrians, and even a new gateway sign to welcome people to downtown. Um, also, the historic marker program, I just want to note, is wonderful, and the historical museum seems to be playing a very active role in it. Um, but there's nothing on the town website that talks about it. So that could be an area of improvement. It's just making that program more widely known that folks can um, have apply to get a house marker installed in their town so you can celebrate your incredible history. Public art. Um, to move forward on the public art, we're recommending that you either work with an existing committee or more likely just create an ad hoc public art committee of local stakeholders that could pursue funding and administer a program. Um, this could be an application to your local LCC to have, start with some seed money. Um, out of which you could create an RFP to solicit artists who would want to install, uh, to paint a creative crosswalk or electrical boxes. So starting small, um, and then if you can implement something small and get a committed group going, then you can follow up with more um, larger scale installations such as a uh, gallery of banners or a mural on Crosby's or temporary sculpture along the harbor. And then in terms of public restrooms, um, the next steps would be to begin the permitting process, um, depend uh, at Masco Park and the municipal lot, and to hire an architect to start growing their plans for the one at Masco Park, since that seems to be the, the, the most expensive, but also the highest priority. All right, well, that's about the end of my presentation, so uh, I'm open to your questions and feedback at this stage. Uh, yeah, any um, thought of hiding the um, gray shed that the MBTA put up in Reed Park then for the traffic signal? Um, I, I heard something about I, the 
What, what, was, what was your question about the shed, the MBTA you know, shed? Some kind of um, it's hiding it some way with maybe, uh, I don't know, shrubs or um, a bathroom. artwork. Or a bathroom, yeah. <laughs> a bathroom? Oh, yes. <laughs> Good idea. Sarah? Um, I think Greg is on, and I guess my question <clears throat> is, who is the recipient of this study, um, given that we didn't hear about it from the Downtown Improvement Committee? Is this next, is the next step that the recommendations here go to the Downtown Improvement Committee or Select Board or, uh, and then that was follow up. I, you know, at this point I, I defer to, um, uh, it was quite, yeah, a question for Greg. That's the other one. Oh, for Greg. Okay, thank you. Yeah, he's on. Yeah. Greg, can you answer? Uh, sure. So, uh, so we would we would start the, so this ultimately goes to the selectmen for for implementation, um, and they would want input from from not only the planning board but the, but downtown improvement as well, and so that would also be a stop along the way. They have been working with the Downtown Improvement Committee all the way along. Okay. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, I'm trying to, uh, bathrooms aside and safety aside, which we talked about with the planning board, I am trying to figure out what problems your solutions solve. So can you help me understand the goals? Define placemaking, because I feel my... And I'll, I'll, I'll withhold my, my opinion. Can you help me understand the problem, besides safety and bathrooms, that you were trying to solve? Yeah, we're, we're trying to think holistically about the public realm in downtown Manchester. Um, so, you know, in any place, improvements are made incrementally. Um, by different property owners who will put out a bench or, um, you know, bookshelf or what have you. And there can become some interstitial spaces that kind of get forgotten about. Um, some pieces of furniture that become tired um, because it's something that you see every day and, and you don't necessarily uh, have a, a fresh look at it. So. This was an attempt to think holistically about the downtown uh, to use these different components to create more of a welcoming space uh, that will encourage people to linger downtown uh, and frequent the businesses and, you know, be able to be comfortable. So whether that's... Um, having the ability to have a picnic in the park because there are benches available or to be able to use a public facility so they don't have to go home quickly. Um, these are, we think that improving the public realm can, can help improve your economic development as well. Okay. I think I can give some context to this too. Um, so this was done during the middle of the pandemic and um, I think the, the towns of Manchester and Essex were concerned about their how they were going to recover from the pandemic and how could they attract visitors. And so they got a joint grant between the two communities. And the, I think their original thought was there'd be some <laughs> similar solutions. But it turned out Essex went in a very different way, which they're a very different town. So it turned into two very different, um, I don't know, two different programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Downtown Improvement Committee was very interested in trying to solve problems for visitors especially. That's where the bathrooms came and in. And the And the wayfarer. Okay. And then I have a couple of specific points. Um, I can appreciate a couple of the uh, solutions being right for other communities. I think that a, well, rainbow colored sidewalks are not for Manchester and I think that it just needs some more thought. That's my opinion, but 
as I said in the prior discussion, everyone has an opinion. I also think that we need some bike parking, but we need it in the right places, and that bike parking for Manchester need not necessarily be the street art, given the prior discussion about the width of sidewalks and so forth. Um, so I think bike parking is a good thing to think about, but where should it be, and then what's the, how do you accommodate the most number of bikes in a secure place? So I guess I've, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned that we are putting uh, ornaments in um, places that this that the these things are orna, are individually individual good ideas that become kind of mushed together potentially mushed together without you know somebody who really knows how to take care of them and to think carefully about um, the risk kind of over uh, I don't know ornamenting <laughs> what is I think the iconic we've talked about history but we also have the iconic harbor and um, and then lastly, I think we do probably need a restroom at Masconomo Park, but its location needs to be, uh, you know, carefully engineered with some um, visual studies. So, you know, I'm not going to prejudge where you've selected it. Uh, I'll just say I think it need, it's going to need a, it would need a very careful set of renderings. Um, so that's. Yeah, this this is just the, the first yeah. stage of, well, I've, you've been working on this for a while. This is a continuation of your work um, that was meant to help it along. And, and it's great to hear you think that Mass Canal Park is a good location. We, I didn't say the, that. The I said it needs some mat, thought. <laughs> the dot on the map was selected out of a uh, site tour, a walking tour that we did with Betsy yeah. Ware and Jim Brown. And we identify the location where there's some existing hedges that already block the view of the park from the street. And we thought that um, some of those, they're, they're overgrown shrubs at this point. We thought that some of those could be replaced with, um, with the facility. But as you said, it's going to take a lot more studies and a lot more careful thought um, from architects and landscape architects to determine the exact spot. So yes, I think you know, um, Chris, you're right. This was a grant money that was out, and I think these last two presentations that we had are almost conflicting with each other. I really did appreciate the crosswalk in front of Captain Dusty's with the brick and more historical. Um, I agree, Sarah, that you know, painting a sidewalk in front of Captain Dusty's, I don't belong. I don't believe it belongs in Manchester. I guess in the longevity bench program, we have, I mean, at least 30 benches all over town that are the traditional black wrought iron that look like they're going to stand the test of time versus a wooden back that's going to need maintenance. So now we're introducing a new material into the mix. So I thought the presentation with the downtown improvement was also supposed to be streamlining lighting. So I'm not sure why we wouldn't follow the path of benches that we already have now introducing something new. So if anything, we should just stick with the longevity benches and keep that consistent because we have several dozen of them. Um, the tables, I do like that idea. Like that was a really nice idea. I'm not sure, in my opinion, the pocket park at that intersection makes sense. You know, children in our town tend to bike in groups, and Bridgedale, or the old Bridgedale name, is a, a section where those children would congregate and go in and get ice cream or candy or whatever. Um, I think that would just turn into a bike dump for, for um, you know, the children in town. And I think you would lose the, the banners, and you wouldn't be able to actually see. And I do think that that intersection does provide a lot of um, information for the town. So putting a part of benches and a pocket park is going to block that information for town. So maybe some other updating in that area versus a park. I think that idea over near where the boxes could be something to think about. I do have a concern about putting bathrooms behind town hall. If we're just making bathrooms available in town hall, it seems redundant. So maybe, you know, look at that financial option before we put two bathrooms in. I do think bathrooms at Masconome will make the most sense if we're going to put them anywhere. Um, I, I you know I wasn't a big fan of the street bikes. 
I mean, they, it just our town is historic seaside community. Some of these things looked a little too urban, and I think it would, I don't know, change the feel. I do like the idea of some art, but personally, changing the benches and the bikes and, you know, the Carl of Roll sidewalks, I don't think it's, um, in my opinion, Manchester. But that's it. Yeah, we, we were not suggesting you change out those 30 beautiful teak benches. That you no, but I think why, why, why add another material? It's just why not keep going with what we have? Sure. Yeah, that can absolutely make that decision. We just want to provide another option. Ms. Uh, yeah, thanks, Daniel. Uh, my comments were uh, that we do have an opportunity here to think about the public realm, and it is, is good to see this following on the um, presentation before, because the, pre the presentation before illustrated how narrow our sidewalks already have, are, and that's a problem. And now to put bike racks and other things that we'd like to put, furnishing zones, there's just no place on our sidewalks as they are. So that emphasizes for me, if we want to do these kinds of things, we have to think about the width of our sidewalks and accessibility overall. But I agree with you what, what you said about visual clutter. So I think that we want to do this with the highest quality mm -hmm. materials, with, the, you know, putting things where we need a bench or we need a bathroom, but not putting too much out there that starts to feel kind of cluttered, especially in a fairly crowded downtown. Like, let's be thoughtful about where these services are needed. Um, the and I and I think Manchester is so special that making all of these decisions about site furnishings and bathrooms, they should all be really particular to Manchester. So the the bathhouse is a model. I, I think I actually mentioned that back in whenever was the last time we met, but I think that's a great model for a bathroom that you identify as this is a Manchester piece of um, architecture. And if you are going to do two, by the time you hire an architect to design a small building and build a little bathhouse type building, you might as well use the same design and put it somewhere else. But I do question whether we need a bathroom right now, a town hall in the parking lot. I can see both sides in that we already have a bathroom. So I think there's pretty good access for that if people understand that it's there. Um, on the other hand, having a bathroom in the parking lot, we're really trying to get people to use the parking lot and um, take some of the pressure off the street parking. You know, that's one more draw. But the audience of who's using the bathroom, I think, is the important question to ask. And um, putting it in Mascadomo or Reed Park gets the boaters, gets the people coming off the train, gets the people who park and get out of their car, gets the cyclists. Like everybody, it's on the way to everything. It's at downtown, it's on the way to the beach. And so I think really thinking about where the service is most needed. Um, is important. Um, and while I like the bathhouse idea, I think the site furnishing that is shown is kind of a generic idea of, you know, ye old historic looking benches. That's like a very generic um, park bench modeled on the, you know, the kind of central park bench. The fixed tables I don't think are historic looking. I think that's kind of a, a mismatch with the benches. But in general, I find that fixed tables and fixed benches don't fit anybody. It's too far away or it's too close. You don't fit in the chair. People have all different kinds of body sizes and abilities. And generally, I think that fixed tables and chairs just means like we don't trust you to not take the table away, so we're going to attach it to the ground. Same, you know, with a bench placed off the table. So if we, if there are businesses that want to put out cafe type seating, you know, you mentioned the library as the most cohesive example. None of that is fixed furnishing. It's all high quality benches and tables that are kind of too heavy to move, but people can kind of, you know, move them around a little bit or move the, the chair in relation to the table. So I, I think that's a good model, not talking about the materiality, but thinking about <clears throat> seating that gives people choices, right, rather than have everything fixed to the ground. And we might think about Adirondack chairs or something that can be put out on the lawn. I think the more choices you give people to gather in their own size groups and their own you know, whatever whatever groups they come in, I think is more successful than adding many more benches than we already have. Um, I would agree with Christina's point about like how many bench models do we need. I personally don't love the long the longevity bench model because I think metal can be a little cold or a little hot, but um, but we do have a number of them. So either let's keep going with that or let's find a wooden one that looks you know specific to the image that we want to create in town, which I think 
historic is fine, but let's just not be generic or historic about it. Um, so if we do go with site furniture, let's be let's put some more thought into that. And then I think on the visual clutter list, like painting the transformer boxes and um, adding signage kiosks and the painted crosswalk, that all kind of falls into the visual clutter. Mm -hmm. To me, um, I really advocate for a mixture of loose and site furnishings, thinking about, you know, what do we really need? What are the services we need? And not just kind of putting stuff out there to activate the open space if it's not really going to be used by people or useful, and particularly if it's going to neck down the sidewalks that are already too narrow. Um, the things like the murals could be interesting. Uh, you know, the Browns mural is kind of um, interesting sort of, you know, picture of its time. Um, if we do do murals or public art, I think we want to think about being very welcoming with whatever the um, subject matter is and making it um, approachable and again site specific, you know, maybe it's designed by Manchester school kids or that kind of thing. So I think there are good ideas and I strongly agree with the idea of discontinuing the granite memorial benches. I think we have a lot of those already. They're not comfortable, unfortunately. They're often not in a place where anybody really needs to sit. And um, and I think with we might want to think about how we incorporate names in spaces because you get a lot of names and it can start to feel like you're kind of privatizing the space and these these are all people who are important to their loved ones, but the open spaces of Manchester are for everyone. And so um, I, I'm on board with uh, a moratorium, kind of discontinuing the memorial benches and uh, engraved names on things. Thank you. That was it. Okay, anyone else? Mary? Um, I won't repeat. Um, well, thank you for the presentation. I won't repeat. I think um, I agree with it's a fine line with visual clutter um, and that might not be the character of Manchester. I thought even some of the signage or the wayfinding, whatever it's called, um, looks very much like any town you're going to see. Um, so hoping we could have some um, uniqueness to Manchester, some character that wouldn't be just like so many other towns around. Um, could you clarify, were you proposing your, um, where you wanted the restroom was right on Beach Street at Masconomo Park? Was it at the front or was it in the back? Well, it looked like the stall located in the front. Yeah, it looked like you wanted it more on the sidewalk. Um, I believe that that location, the path, the path kind of goes into the interior of Maskinoma Park. Uh, so I think there's a sidewalk and a path, maybe, and so it would be in between, in within the park. It oh. wouldn't I mean this this is something that back. we will need a landscape architect to site. We you know, this is a dot on a map. It's not an exact yeah, I'm just trying to figure out the location, um, not any design details, but was it more towards the sidewalk or more towards the walk in the back? I think the, the goal in my mind would be to ensure that there are sight lines to the facility from downtown, from essentially the, the train tracks from that intersection. So you can see it, but I think you would want it, I would imagine you'd want a little bit into the park so it sits as kind of part of the park and not as like a way station right off the Sidewalk. Okay, yeah, it looked like the star was close to the sidewalk, so I think the ideal spot would be further back, kind of probably where the port apart potties currently are, set back. Um, but, um, so yeah, so again, the visual clutter. Um, I was the one that had the comment that I was concerned that you put the planning board as part of a working group um, when we're not really part of a working group for this. Um, and some of the data within the uh, document, it relies on the UMass Donahue Institute population projection, projections, and you, you make um, some brief recommendations around that. I would take all of that with a grain of salt. They're projecting that we're going to lose 1,500 residents in the next 20 years, so I think that's kind of a little far-fetched in my opinion. Um, and... 
What else? Um, I my concern with the the restrooms, and I guess it's probably a, well both Masco and behind Town Hall is that we would be building any structures in a floodplain. Um, I think if we can utilize the Town Hall restrooms and um, you know knowing how much it is to what was proposed at Reed Park for the restrooms, I think you know to build a new structure would be. Um, maybe not the smartest idea, but um, so those are my comments. Okay. I just have one comment. Done. I think maybe it was taken out of. I like the idea of the chess table of the furniture. I like gathering and, you know, let's meet down in Reed Park and play chess. And my overall concern is maintenance. Mm -hmm. And behind Jeez. Tuck's Jeez. Point, I don't know if it's. Achi or horseshoes, but you really can't tell what it is. So we have some great things, but we don't tend to take care of anything. So anything that needs immediate maintenance, I think should be really thought about twice in this town because we just don't do a good job at it. Just gonna, what, what I thought, it's sort of in the same, um, I'm not sure we don't take care of anything, but I think we work hard to take care of a lot of things. But I do think the more things you have scattered around, the more difficult it is to maintain them. And so um, the kiosks, um, if you've been to college campuses, you see the kiosks that are kind of cluttered with things. And they are um, uh, hard to maintain, and, uh, and you need to have somebody who owns them. Um, really, you know, really owns These, their, their, yeah, but maintains them and the manages them, them and... Uh, for them to be, unless you want the, you know, everything stapled on top of everything else, um, lost cat on top of, you know, park concert in the park, which may be a look, I mean, it's a look that is works for some places, but I think it's more of an urban look. And it also um, is, it doesn't help with wayfinding that for people who are not in, not on pedestrians, I mean, not on foot, and I think most people right now are beginning to find out about events on their phones. Um, so electronic, the effort might, you know, it, it's going to. It needs to be. There needs to be ownership of of these things. And um, so, for example, the life jacket racks get things stapled to them, and I think by on sometimes removes and sometimes doesn't. They get used as a kiosk right now, and I think they can tend to look messy, so. Yeah, I, I agree. Maybe I should have been more specific with the kiosk recommendation. The, the recommendation came out of um, two needs. Um, neither one of them was for community posting. Um, one was to direct residents to future, to restroom facilities and to businesses to assist with their orientation and wayfinding. And um, rather than having a multitude of individual signs throughout downtown, we thought if you had a signature kiosk that was unique to Manchester, it could draw people and have a map and orient people to space. So that would be one key element to have on it. And then the other is um, historical information about the town, which could be a permanent, also a permanent fixture on a kiosk. Um, we spoke with the Manchester Historical Museum, and they expressed um, concerns with how difficult it is to create historic signage. Um, and they were advocating actually for, you know, they, they do their historic home program, but they didn't want a ton of, they weren't very excited to see a lot of interpretive signage about the history of the town throughout downtown. To, because that would have created more visual clutter. So they, uh, so the, the kiosk was a, a way to, to bring in a desire to celebrate your history and to orient um, folks. I think those would be the primary purposes more than um, having uh, creating a community message board. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. So can I ask? What are okay. the next steps of where funding comes from this? Does the town vote on it? So I'm just a little, where do we go from here? Do you know where it's going? Um, it's going I'm assuming it goes to the select board for funding. 
um, the town did apply for the wayfinding grant under the MDI program. So that would start in the fall if the funding comes through. So this is something that if you received a grant, the people in Manchester would just be like, hey, we got this money, we're doing it? I was asked to write a grant for wayfinding. So I'm just, I'm, I'm literally asking a so, question. So you can, I'm sure you can talk with the select board and Greg and say we don't need it. If, well, if that's right. your opinion. It's not my opinion, I'm asking a question. I don't know who makes the call other than Greg and the select board. But I mean, there, there's obviously a menu choice of items here. So right. I don't think everything right. would be moving forward with any of it. So. Okay. Um, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I think the board gave a lot of good ideas to you guys, and um, thanks for coming in. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is a pleasure. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. And I hope to uh, hope to go up and make a visit this summer. Great. Right. You can find parking. <laughs> take the train. <laughs> it's it's the only two forty. Yeah. Um, I'd like to uh, suggest that um, that we make an action item to maybe a couple people oh. get up. Oh. You're downstairs. To um <laughs> to actually try to actually have a conversation with the select board about um, this, um, because I think that we have a real opportunity to knit together the downtown improvement work with the um, placemaking work and the historic character and the need for bathrooms. But I, I do worry that in the, that they could become very disjointed efforts. And um, so, um, I think as the planning board that we might, and it seems like we've all spoken to that concern. Um, so maybe we could just, um, a couple of us, find a spot on one of the plan uh, select board's meetings and just kind of get a better understanding of where they're thinking, and it, at least from my perspective, well, like get a sense of where they're thinking. Would this be an agenda item yeah. for the select board at some point? Yeah. This Yes. Or maybe when they take it up, we could just be invited so that um, and make sure we have one of us available to kind of convey. I think we've had pretty much quite similar uh, concerns. And um, so, Mary? Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. I think, it, I mean, from what I heard tonight, the select board is, you know, the downtown improvement reports up to the select board and the civic space, you know, the select board asked for a grant. So, it sounds like the select board is managing both of these, so it would be up to them to make sure that they are not in silos and that they are coordinated project management. So I don't know who's doing that, but um, yeah. So sounds like the select board is. Okay, so we'll be uh, an item on the select board at some future date. I'm happy to just have a conversation with Ann. To with Greg, you know, just to let her know that we talked and then we'd like to, when they take this up, then bring us yeah. up. Um, Chuck said you, uh, like when I was asking about the yeah. starting point of, you know, eliminating a parking space or not. Right. Um, he also said he had further discussion. Yeah. So I'm happy Chuck, to, of course, yeah. check in with him. Good. That's helpful. Okay. Thank you, Daniel, again. Um, so um, I've asked Greg to come in to speak a little bit on the what's happening with the land use director, town planner, um, and uh, I'll let uh, Greg explain uh, where we stand. Sure, and sure. Um, so we've uh, benefited greatly from Betsy's service over the last few months. Um, unfortunately, her time is um, restricted <laughs> as, uh, as a retiree. Um, and the position, that's his recommendation, is that we, we need a full-time planner. I think I've heard similar comments from, from uh, the majority of you as well. Um, so, we, uh, we have advertised for uh, a full-time position. Um, I think you have a copy of the job description, so if you have thoughts on um, um, what that description uh, describes, it would be helpful to hear your input. 
And um, uh, going forward in the past, when, uh, when we hired our first planner, the, uh, the chair was involved in, in that process in terms of interviewing and helping uh, make the selection. Um, you could do a similar process where you could do some input as to how you want to see that play out. So I'm looking for uh, some feedback on, on the job description. You think it captures everything that is, uh, is needed and looking for your comments about sort of the, the qualities that you would like to see. I um, don't need to hear that from everybody tonight, but if you want to, if you have some thoughts, that's fine. If you want to send me an email with, with those qualities that you feel would be appropriate, um, that would be helpful as, as well. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, timeline, um, um, ideally we would have someone on board um, by, uh, by October. And that would allow a little bit of transition time with, with Betsy. I would love to uh, um, convince Betsy to stay on to, to service the MBTA project in particular. And that's something she needs to work out with, with her um, other commitments and pressures in life. <laughs> so um, we, we, we continue to have those discussions. Um, there's also the SL signaling. Uh, that we expect to get an application in six weeks, maybe. End of August, beginning of September. September. So um, we'd like to have somebody, uh, you know, plan our experience on board that we can help the process. Help the process. Help. Sure. The consultants and you know, public hearing <coughs> and what have you. So, uh, Somebody new coming in, I guess it'd have to be some of Betsy's time. And, There'd be uh, some transition, I think. And if we don't get somebody by, um, I mean, I, I know you're optimistic, but we, we would always have a town planner. Um, I mean, is there going to be a point where Betsy's no longer here and we have nobody selected yet? That would be so, an issue for us. So that there's no guarantee that that, that won't happen. We're going to try to prevent that as best we can. Um, and if it, if it came to where we needed to look for another interim, then that's something we, we, would, we would do if we have to. Okay. Um, any questions from the board on this? Chris? Craig, have you had any feedback yet from... Any response from potential candidates at all? Uh, not yet. It just got uh, published the uh, first of the week. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's been very spare new. And there, have you got sort of an outreach program going to contact planning schools and like MIT and Harvard? And so we've asked Betsy to help with, with that in terms of um, you know the planner listserv that, that's available. Yeah, the listserv, yeah. For planners in the state. Um, and yeah, we'll start reaching out to to um, different uh, schools, as you say, um, graduate schools in particular. Um, if you have ideas or, or thoughts on that, I'd welcome to it. But we'll certainly get it um, published in the uh, MA and APA and um, the listserv, et cetera. Aaron? Um, I had a general question and then some detailed questions on the job description. So when did we move from a town planner role to a director of land management town planner? Because director implies um, one that supervises, and so is this new role supervising others? So the, the, the idea of that is to have um, um, bring in the, uh, the building inspector under the plan as well. So that's where that director role comes in. So that was the discussion that the select board had when we talked about different models. So this person, so the building inspector would now report to the director of land management. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, and then some of the responsibilities from at least the 2014 job description seem to be gone. Like. Um, removed, it was removed, reviewing of, of development proposals and applications for completeness. Who's now do, would do that role? So when an application comes into the planning board, 
it was the town planner role to review for completeness. And the planner would still be heavily involved with that. Okay, so that that was removed from the description. I, I was just wondering why. Um, and then the um, I, one of a recommendation I would have is to have, and I didn't see it in here. I might have just over didn't see it. Um, project management, project plan skills. Um, I think that's very important. And number seven, it says applies for and administers, oh no, I'm sorry. Um, number six, develops, conducts, and coordinates other plans and studies for the town. And I would add in conjunction with the planning board. Um, I don't want to lose the responsibility that the planning board is the, the land use board in the town. Um, I think that's important to keep that. But there may be planning studies that aren't planning board related. Um, there may be, so I think you have to maybe have both scenarios in there. Um, I think this this appeared to me with the rewording of things to be moving towards the director of land management and kind of the planning board under that, and I just want to make sure that that's not your intent. And there's not under the director, there are separate entities. I understand that. I'm just saying so. I, from this description, it, it um, doesn't make that as clear as it did in 2014. So I just want to make where, sure. Where does it make it as clear? Um, when it says that, you know, they're off doing their own land use studies that would not be in conjunction with the planning board. Um, when it... Um, uh, I don't think that was a change from the 2014 description. That was. It was that. Was that? I think it was added. It was an added line. So um, I'm just when and it could, it could just be a title. I don't know if it has to do with unions or if it's a um, it becomes a, a different type of position in town. Just when I see director, it's a different type of position. That's all I'm saying. Any other comments? Or, I was, oh, I was just going to say, I think we need a full-time planner. I think Betsy's um, done a great job, and it's no, um, absolutely no criticism of her. But I do think um, she works really hard, and it's hard to get everything done. So uh, thank you for moving it forward, and um, we look forward to, I look forward to seeing some great candidates um, could there be a land use planner part time and a planner part time? Uh, that possibility. What, what do you mean by how, what are you distinguishing? Yeah. You know, have different roles. Like a land use planner has a has a role that he or she can be responsible for, and then then a planner can kind of split it. If, if, I'm just thinking if there's not right. any candidates. Just some kind of scenario where we have somebody that we can you know, fall back to, especially during this critical signal, cell signal. Yeah, I guess I'd turn to Betsy's comment on that, whether you think two part-time positions might be an option. I think that would be very difficult. Um, having, Having been pretty much a sole planner for communities most of my life, or most of my professional career, um, there's a reliance on um, consultants. But pretty much you're, as a planner, the kind of chief cook and bottle washer. Um, so I think it would be, if it were split so that um, you know, there was a very discreet task, it would be doable. But I think you'd want, you know, your planner in there for full time. Um, and I think it would be hard to kind of job share. Um, I think you could hire somebody to, um, you know, help write a decision or, um, or work on a very specific so task. I'm just worried that just the way the job market is. I mean, I know in my business we're having trouble finding right. anybody. It's a tough market. right now. There's no question. You know, going across seat the corporate seas for people. So, Laura. 
really glad to hear this is moving ahead. Uh, fall, a full time job, I think, was going to be more attractive to most candidates than a part time job. Most people need to earn a living with a full time level um, employment. So I hope that gets us good candidates. Um, I, I really appreciate all Betsy has done for us, particularly some of the things that she's instituted that I'd love to see continued are you know, the preliminary drafting of the decision paper mm -hmm. for us to comment on so we're not going to start it from scratch. Um, the planner's memo that gives mm -hmm. us um, a sort of high level summary of, you know, here are the issues really has helped us, I think, become more efficient and sort of focus our discussions on uh, particularly when it's, you know, kind of gives you the guardrails of here's what's in our jurisdiction and here are the things that we're being asked to look at. And um, and so, you know, try to focus your discussion this way. Those things have been really helpful. Um, Betsy comes with a lot of experience. This is, uh, I don't know whether the salary is commensurate with a full-time, you know, how much experience someone will have. If they're coming right out of grad school, they may have some years of experience before. Um, I think we'd be lucky to have very experienced person in the role for a while, so I'm kind of curious to see what we'll get. Um, but I do think uh, the experience is um, helpful in kind of organizing. You know, we're an all volunteer board, and so many town boards are. Most of our, most of not all, I guess, our boards are all volunteer, and so having someone in a professional role really understands the professional. Um, for professional discipline is valuable. I think we can certainly use the position full time. Um, and if I, I'll just be interested to see if anyone comes with a um, climate resiliency on their resume. You know, being in a coastal town and the challenges that are ahead of us, um, that would be something that I'd be just interested to see if people are listing that on their CVs and what they're doing with it. Christina? Um, I guess when it comes down to recommended minimum qualifications, I'm, I'm concerned about or other related field. I feel that uh, we, if we're hiring a town planner, we need to stick with the education and experience of a town planner. I do understand that this might be a difficult environment to find someone, but I don't want to choose someone and not have the right requirements just because we might be stuck. I mean, there's no mention of the EICP here. I'm not sure why if that was an intentional oversight, but why not ask for someone that is a certified planner? Um, the other thing is, I mean, Betsy went through this with the with uh, Newbury board. I mean, the entire board there decided a new town planner. I don't understand why the entire board is not going to be involved with this process. Other towns employ that. I think we're the anomaly that don't. So I think the entire board should interview this person. If they're supporting us, I think we all should have input. I would not do that with, um, yeah, there's an issue of confidentiality, at least for the first rounds. Mm -hmm. um, you will limit your applicant pool if you make everything a public meeting. Because people who are applying and they're not sure they're a, strong, they're not a finalist, they may not want to let the world know that they're looking. Well, I so, think the way that Newbury did it, it was the final two, correct? I'm sorry? Newbury did it in the final two. So I, I can see that point. But when there's a, a decision between a few, I think the entire board should be involved. So um, I'm just not sure that's an efficient way to proceed. And it kind of, to me, I mean, I have not been involved in the town government for very long, but that just seems a little bit out of how the town usually hires employees. Um, my other point, since we started to discuss some of the specifics, um, in number four, when they're talking, of, when you're talking about the zoning bylaws, um, I would love for you to include something about um, a, a 
a skill that I think Betsy has done very well, and that is interfacing with legal counsel, mm -hmm. um, which is a big part of getting our zoning bylaws to the finish line and having them be correct. Um, so I'd love to see I don't know how you want to word that, or um, maybe that's an interview question, but just the ability to easily work with legal counsel and uh, fluency with the legal issues regarding zoning. Um, and then the other specific skill um, suggestion I have is um, technical expertise with the um, the online tools that the planners have to use. I think Betsy is skilled in this too, but um, there will only be more of them, um, mm -hmm. and they just need to be facile with them um, and efficient with them. So I don't know how you want to uh, stru structure that either, and maybe that's an interview question, but I think that's important. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to sort of counter Christine's suggestion of just limited to, perhaps to planning because um, right now there are lots of uh, academic experiences, I think, or that particularly coupled with work experience that we want to be open to. You know, somebody might be a landscape architect or an engineer. My sister has been a career planner and she has a degree in geography. So I, th I think we, there's a range of um, skills that's not always called planner in an academic situation. So I would encourage you to keep it broad and see who we get. And we want their experience um, and um, sometimes continuing education and other kinds of uh, professional experience or lived experience or experience serving on a planning board or whatever um, can make someone um, uniquely qualified. Uh, I would not limit it to a particular degree or Bethy. Yes, I have a comment about AICP. So you'll notice when you got my resume, I don't have AICP. I had an AICP designation for seven or eight years, and I didn't see any benefit, so I let it lapse. Um, anybody in this position is going to do education. Um, so I don't think it's mandatory. It might be beneficial, but all it tells somebody is that you can take a test, you can pass a test, you can pay your seven hundred or nine hundred dollars a year for the be for the benefit of AICP certifi certification. So, I think that we were in the past in a situation that we had someone in the role that wasn't qualified. So whatever we can do to ensure if we're going to create our own questions that they need to answer to our satisfaction, thus my point that we need to be involved. So Susan, I mean, people, citizens have sat down, the fire chief, the police chief. So there are opportunities for residents and to participate and listen to and choose these positions. Um, I think we're unique that we're not choosing our position. We are... Um, the select board chooses you, Greg, and we, in turn, as elected people, feel that we should be choosing this person that supports us. If the role is to support us as elected officials, I think we should have this voice as a board. So thank you for that, and I, I can appreciate that designation. I get that, but I do think that we need to make sure for hiring someone, this board feels that they have the skills to support us in all these different ways, legal, sustainability, and we should be the ones having input. We all have different angles, and we all should be able to give that input. You want to make a motion? Can, can I just add something? Sure. Yeah. Okay. When I interviewed as the first town planner in Winchester, it was a fairly lengthy process, but um, what they did initially is all the boards and commissions that I would be staffing there was a representative from each. Mm -hmm. And there were probably eight or ten people. You were in the hot seat, and they interviewed you. And that was an hour, an hour and a half interview. Then as it narrowed down, there were discussions with the town manager, who was the appointing authority, but there was always one or two planning board members. So it wasn't a quorum, and that those one or two, two or three people weren't making a decision 
but they were getting a sense. And then it was not a public meeting because it was, they weren't making a decision and it wasn't um, a majority of the plan of the planning board. And then the last meeting was with the entire board. And that was, as I recall, was it was a public meeting. We can't use executive session for interviews. You, you can for preliminary. You cannot for finals. But but and you as the as the appointing authority, I can have advisors. Yeah. As many advisors as I, I want to have help. As long as you have a quorum. Um, as long as I don't have a quorum of yeah. any particular board. Yes. But as the person who was being interviewed, not only people got a sense of me, but I got a sense That's of the boards right. that I was going to yeah. be supporting. How is the select board handling this? Are they um, involved in the uh, interview process? No, they haven't. No, typically, they would not. Okay. Laura? Just a couple more thoughts on the, um, well, the professional designation. AICP is a good one. You can take an AICP exam if you're an architect, a planner, a landscape architect. You can have all kinds of disciplines and study and take the exam and pass it. Whatever credentials they come from, I think it's informative to you as you're looking at the resume. So it may be AIA or AICP, but you know that does tell us something about their training. And I wouldn't say it's mandatory, but it tells us something about their training and their um, certifications or licensure, which is um, a factor. One yeah, skill that I it'll yeah, it'll be on the resume. I don't think you have to go poking too much further than that. Really, you'll see it. Um, one thing that I didn't mention, I don't know if this is really germane to the planner position, but it would certainly be useful, is uh, um, some kind of graphic presentation skills. And it might depend on which kind of angle the person is coming from, but we have talked a lot about wanting to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, with a little more ease to the, um, you know, to some of these complex issues and uh, boil them down or present them in a way. We don't have consultant dollars to do that on a regular basis, but if the planner could help us, I think that would be a great service because she would, even if we have a, you know, kind of communications person and um, Tiffany or others, um, I think the person having the technical knowledge who's making the presentation, that's a benefit to us to trying to tell a story that's a, maybe a difficult story to tell, and we're trying to communicate in a clear way. Um, so that, and I don't know if that's um, extra on top of the bread and butter, extra jam, but it would be great <laughs> if they had it, if they had any kind of portfolio like that. As far as the interview, um, I think that we're all kind of rotating through these positions. We change over time. This person's going to report to you. And so I think that you should be the one to select the person um, and make sure that it's a good mutual fit for you. And um, if you want to bring the person in as a courtesy and meet with some combination of the boards or the planning board, whoever it is at the last round, I think that's fine too. But I don't feel, personally, I don't feel a need to be involved in the hiring decision. Yeah. I was just going to suggest, ask that Greg and maybe Ron work out a process that does sort of something along the lines that, that Betsy has suggested. Think a little bit about Christina's comment about, you know, wanting to maybe a final presentation in front of the board. But, um, and the, the benefit of, of having the board members meet with him or her before the final is I think we learn something too. Um, it's an opportunity for us to hear how Duxbury did something, or Ipswich did something, or Concord did something, or um, and and so that we we get an opportunity, or at least some of us, to, to hear, even if it's not a finalist, um, you know, from their experience about how they handled something um, that might be useful to us as we proceed. So um, maybe the two of you could figure out a appropriate. You know, you're just in the first phase, your second phase. You wrote the job description, you've posted it, and as you get the candidates in you know, sort of come up with a proposal, um, a set of, a, a process that makes sense to you um, as the hiring manager, but that does give, to Betsy's point, get give a candidate, the finalists in any way, or the semi-finalists, uh, opportunities to see who they're working with and what we think the issues are. And, so that's just be my suggestion. 
So I guess back to this, Greg and I and Chris and Mary, when we were doing the rules and regulations before policies and procedures, we had talked about an MOU and there was going to be clear delineation responsibilities that the planner would report to the planning board, but then there was administrative details and responsibilities that Greg would be handling. So to me at this point, I mean, if we're going to follow through with something on that level, then we should be involved with choosing the person that this divided MOU is going to be you know, pertaining to. So I don't see why we wouldn't choose it if, if we're going to have this kind of a structure. Is that in the MOU that was sent? Is there an MOU? Is there what? Was that in that draft MOU? What was that? Um, that the town planner report to the planning board. Yeah, there was going to be a dual. There was... So since we are an elected board, we should have some autonomy through the town planner. But I'm not sure how this works with a director of land management. It kind of changes a bit. So I'm curious what you think this should look like now. What, what would it look like? The MOU. Well, we need to have a decision about whether or not the planning board feels like there needs to be an MOU. Um, and no, I don't think it changes. It, it, it's a direct that doesn't change the nature of what potentially be created. So, uh, two ways to proceed. Um, I'll take a motion, maybe to do a. I have like a why don't we wait and see if we get some candidates before we start? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're, this, you sound like you're going to get 20 candidates for this. Well, that's what well, I'm worried that, about. That I'm worried one, 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 hopefully one will be qualified. No they're not going to be 20 candidates. Bumble we'll our way through the cell signal. We'll be really lucky if we get three. But let's see if we even get three before we worry about this. All right. Did the MOU make an No. So as for, I mean, as... Until we have some other agreement, maybe, and I don't know, even know if we are authorized to do it, but the, plan, the planner or director of land management reports to Greg, yeah. unless there's some other, um, has, we, has that been changed uh, in any? No. And I guess, to me, it makes sense. We are not equipped to manage personnel as a volunteer board. I do think that the uh, planner obviously works closely with the planning board and, is, and, you know, perhaps it would be helpful to have a more formal set of responsibilities that we can do once a year and, a, you know, the chair having some input into uh, a review, an annual review or something like that. But, um, but it seems to me that we're ill-equipped to manage staff. I don't think the point was to manage staff, was to manage what we need from staff. So Frank and... Why don't we pull out that MOU and take at a look at it? At least take a stab at it. Yeah, I just, well. Is it in the SharePoint? No. <laughs> Can I just say it's, it's 9 o'clock? This is yeah, getting a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Could we move on? <laughs> we can <laughs> we we'll discuss it at the next meeting by putting it in a place where we can all see it. Yeah. As a draft. Yeah, we'll, we'll turn to Betsy's yeah. extensive experience about how the relationship between the planner and the planning board has worked in her other communities. I think those are very instructive and can be helpful. Yeah. And writing out, writing. Writing it down would be great. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, um, before you leave, on the next topic that's on the agenda, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, hopefully briefly, on um, any bylaws we may. Is there going to be a town meeting in the fall? That's not set in stone, but. Um, the general anticipation is that there would be. Um, and so, so I think if, if, if you have some topics that you want to bring up, that would <coughs> help make the decision of whether or not to have a fall town meeting. Okay, that's, you know, I was going to talk about it with the board tonight about whether we just want to take a break and not put anything forward, and we have four or five things that we already have in queue. Um, but if we did have a fall town meeting, I mean, just for timeline wise, are you talking November? Yeah, early November. So that would give us, you know, how much time we have. Um, 
to get something, at, you know, public hearing and all the, all the things you got to back up into. And it might be too late now, I don't know, to even propose anything. But, okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure of that. And um, that brings us to the next. So I guess just to yeah. put one more comment on it, if I would rather have a couple, couple free items for the fall and maybe a couple free items in uh, the spring rather than six no, we or so six. <laughs> at the annual. Yeah. So if you no, know, I don't think we're going to be. Well, so I, I'm not speaking look. for the board, but I don't think we're going to be. You know, I think this process of slow uh, yeah. to the town has been working pretty well. So uh, <laughs> I don't, we're not going to inundate with six. But that's just good. Yeah. Plus, we have other, that's, that's other we have time. other <laughs> major things we're uh, we're involved with right now. Sure. So. Yeah. Okay, so just to bring up the next, I just want to give a shout out to Chris and Sarah for their expertise at the town meeting on writing and posting uh, and changing for Article 12. I thought uh, they did a bang up job. We got 80% uh, approval over 80%. So I think the recodification effort was pretty much done. And so now we're going into more bylaw type changes. And I know there's some Scribner errors that we may still need to correct, but. I um, just want to give them a shout out um, on that. So um, I'd just like to discuss, um, we had some things uh, in queue, non-conforming use, residential conservation clusters, senior housing, ADUs, floodplain bylaw, those were some of the things we had talked about and we have some of that stuff written. Um, do we want to pursue any of these things for the fall or just take a break? Um, and I'll just give that up to discussion with for the group. And um, my feeling is, especially on anything that changes density in town, that we um, kind of wait till we see where this MBTA uh, thing goes. Um, uh, but uh, that's... That's uh, my feeling on that. Uh, but on the others, uh, up for discussion. Anyone want to make a comment on going forward or not going forward, Mary? Um, I agree with you, Ron. I think that makes good planning sense that, you know, bringing up density bylaws now is not prudent. Um, the one um, bylaw I would push for that I pushed for prior and um, was talking to a water resource task force, whatever the name is, person, um, is the um, aquifer overlay district to protecting our water supplies. Um, I think that and a floodplain bylaw should carry us for the next while. And with that said, um, with any um, potential housing bylaws, um, and this will fall into another topic as well, but we have been asking for months and months and months for data for how many multifamily units are in the general district, what's the um, lot sizes, the, the density there. Um, you know, we have had a full-time town planner for, we had one for eight and a half years, and we don't have the most basic data for planning, right? We, we, we should know how many housing units are in each district. Are they multifamily? Are they ADUs? Are they single family? Um, are they conforming? Are they non-conforming? Is there wetlands? Is there, you know, all of this stuff. And I don't know that we can do our job and continue to um, propose things when we don't know the basic data. So I'm hoping um, Betsy will say that that stuff is posted on the website. I haven't seen it yet. I know at a meeting a month ago you said we would have it by the end of that week. It's not been posted on the website because there's been delays in getting things posted on the website. We do have some of that information, but um, some of that information like nonconformity um, cannot be determined without going out and taking a look at it, looking at a particular building. Um, And so can we get the data that you have? Um, so well, there's there was two issues. One was that 
um, the assessor's office um, deals with um, mixed-use buildings differently, so we have to go back and do some corrections. Um, secondly, um, as far as I know, the assessor's office does not track ADUs. No, and we and we have heard they, that throughout the years. There have been repeated so, requests for that. Yeah, and we haven't seen any change process in um, you know how the town is handling it. So I think it just it goes down a black hole and, and we're never heard from again. Um, but I would think that you know with all the consultants and everything else that we. The Water Task Force, the MBTA Task Force, <clears throat> not the Water Task Force, the MBTA Task Force, the Planning Board. I mean, we need basic data, and we don't have it. So I um, am asking for that again. Um, I don't want to interrupt you, but I feel like that is a whole other topic, and maybe we could put it as an agenda item for our next meeting. Be forwarding the information that was supposed to be forwarded a month ago. Yes, yes, the whole topic. So I guess I'm just going to request that you could send me what you have so far. I, I think we should talk about it at our next meeting. We've been talking about it for three months, Susan. Right, but you, you know, I agree. With you. There's, I have a lot to say on the data piece too. I think we should take it up right, next let's time. Let's table the data yeah. piece. Hopefully, you'll get something up, yes. whatever you mm -hmm. can, recently. Um, how about? Yeah. Let's go to the main topic here. Should we, should we, in, should, do we want to engage on any bylaw changes oh, for the fall? So, uh, so I'd like to propose one bylaw change, which would be to allow senior housing by special permit in this town. It doesn't require data analysis uh, because we don't really have any senior housing in this town. That's the answer. Every other city in town allows senior housing with a special permit. Why we don't with the oldest population base on the North Shore is crazy. We should just do it. We have it drafted. We can do it easily. Propose it to town meeting. If they turn it down, so be it. But we should at least, at least propose it. Yeah. I'm going to echo Chris's um, proposal for senior housing. Um, I think we have done a good job of doing the administrative stuff and we've heard a lot of conflicting opinions about the policy issues of which, you know, was that, you know, ADUs, residential clusters, senior housing. But we don't know what the town actually feels. So, and the only way you know is to take it, bring it to a vote. Um, and so I think that one is um, consistent with the master plan. And I would propose that we, um, have a subcommittee again and I would, um, that has a couple of meetings, um, one before the end, before Labor Day, um, to map out some uh, high level goals and that we then have a meeting early September to sort of vote on those goals and then to, secondly, to give those goals and our existing draft to the lawyer to. Uh, figure out how to bring those together and any changes in the existing draft, you know, which logistics maybe or whatever. So it's sort of a goal statement to start with that. Um, but I think we've done a lot of work on it. We've heard from a lot of people that it's, uh, um, that they're for it. And we've heard from people that they are against it. So I think the only way you know is to bring it to um, a vote. Um, I also think an aquifer, looking at the aquifer and the floodplain are great, um, and we should be moving forward with those. Um, so, uh, but I think for November, senior housing is achievable. The other one is I think we can change the ADU language, no, the, uh, no, the, what is it, section, um, Non-conforming use? No, um, no, the, uh, <laughs> employees. <laughs> Expand employee to family member, which is what everybody's doing for that provision where the Zoning Board of Appeals grants a special permit for that use. Um, that just simply change uh, employee for the purposes of employees to employee or family member. It's easy to understand. It's consistent with what is already going forward, and we have no idea if the town agrees. And I think if the town doesn't agree with that, then that's a message to the Zoning Board 
to think more carefully about that provision, which is how they are essentially granting AUs right now. Um, so those would be my two proposals. And I'm willing to serve on the subcommittee and to schedule a meeting before the September 1st to see if this is realistic for this topic, or these two topics. So I'll, I'll make a motion that we form a subcommittee to do senior housing. Or oh, maybe anybody else wants to add on. Any other comments on uh, before we move forward on any of these? That's in I've suggested a subcommittee that also includes the building inspector. Oh, that's a good idea. Hmm. Um, I, th I think the aquifer bylaw and the um, floodplain are good. Uh, I just don't think we have time. Floodplain to... will be ready in the spring because we'll have revised maps by then. Yeah, I think the floodplain should be better spring. in the spring because the maps will be in. Oh, yes. I wasn't saying for November. Okay. I think both of those will take a long time oh, yeah. um, to be done well. And, yeah, that's what I, I agree. was... Um, any other comments on that? Um, so, um, I don't know, I'll take a vote to move the um, Not senior housing by special permit bylaw forward for, for full town meeting and form a subcommittee of two or three and uh, include the building inspector and the town planner. And we'll post any meetings. So. Second. So that's. Uh, Seconded any discussion? The subcommittee is of Sarah and Chris and anybody else? Mary, I'll be on. Okay, Mary, Chris, and Sarah. Okay. Any discussion? I'm going to vote no, but I'll be on it. Okay. <laughs> hopefully, we can get to, hopefully we can get to it. No, I don't think you should be on it if you're voting no. You know, it's it's it's, we, we have to diverse the, the pool that has been working on these bylaws. Well, then today. vote for it then. Why don't, I don't, to, why don't we don't make a goal of it. trying to have a unanimous vote for it? How's that? Because I, I just said I, I don't agree with bylaws that is going to increase density, and I definitely don't agree with bylaws that um, for commercial um, okay, well, use we'll in residential. So that, 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 that is, that, excuse me, Chris, could you say that out loud again? Yes, that is a ridiculous argument. Why? There is no commercial use of a senior residential facility. You guys can yeah. talk I'll about this in your subcommittee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, the motion has been made and seconded. And any further discussion? Okay, I'll take a roll call. Uh, Ms. Spilber? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Alden? Yes. Yes. Ms. Delicio? Yes. Ms. Uh, Alden? No. And the chair votes yes. So it's 6 1, and that's what we'll be bringing forward. We'll always move to see if we can bring it forward and get some agreement. So, thank you. That's the next step. Thank you. So, maybe there'll be a special. I mean, you're not going to have You'll be ready even if you don't have a special time. On there, right? Is there a, okay. okay. All right. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Um, we'll get comments to you. I think we've you've gotten enough tonight already, but. Um, and if you have additional ones, feel free. Okay. It's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just to kind of finish up here, cell signaling technologies update uh, Betsy at we a pre application. Had a pre application staff meeting, which included uh, several planning board members and several board members from other boards. Um, generally, the feedback I got was that it was very helpful to kind of keep the dialogue going and um, it was pretty helpful to find out certain technical things about the project um, and um, I think probably a recommendation will be made by me to um, hire an outside consultant for stormwater and uh, traffic and potentially geothermal. Other consultants that uh, Mary? I would add to that, um, and I believe that it, it's in the site plan now, um, that we get an independent consultant for the fiscal analysis. Mm -hmm. um, they said they were going to provide something, but I think we need our own independent. Well, maybe um, we'd have to ask the, excuse me, 
are you going to give us a list of consultants, or are you just going to tell us who the consultants um, are? I'm working on a list. Um, might be good to ask the FinCom for input on the fiscal analysis. Um, Who's our FinCom rep? Mary. <laughs> sorry, Mary. You take care of that. Came out. Sorry. Um, okay. I just I'm not sure what we we're gonna look at for geothermal that the maybe the stormwater person could we can talk about that. I'm not Yeah. Yeah, it's um, sort of a so we can um think about that. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you, Betsy. Um, MBTA Communities uh, Section 3A update on last week's meeting. Any uh, update for the board? So we did two things. First, we talked about a schedule for how the board is going to proceed with various tasks. And the second thing is we adopted a mission statement, which I believe is posted on the website now. So the next meeting is... Uh, August 17th. 17th of August. We also talked about uh, a little bit about zoning and what zoning is and um, the role of zoning plays in the life of the community. Do you feel that maybe a need to meet more often at this point? Or we're going to meet, meet once, twice a month. We're going to meet twice a month starting in September. Okay. There's no point trying to get people to meet more than once in August. No, I hear you. And on Wednesday night, Ann um, Harrison is doing a mapping oh, yeah, I should exercise. Oh, I saw that posted. It's a public meeting. Yes, yeah, 5.30, I think. 5.30 here. Okay. You, want map? you want to know how to do maps? Yes. Please attend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else on MBTA community? I would actually just like to make a comment for the record. I did listen to the meeting, and um, as an elected person, who's, you know, this board's in charge of zoning, some of the comments made by the board members were very concerning. Um, they didn't know the distance between, you know, was it a half a mile or a mile and a half? Another comment was stating that the the heater district D was an overlay district, so the technical acuteness of this board is very concerning. Yeah, so those were not um, planning board members that made those comments. They're I understand, board. Susan. I'm not finished. Okay. And this board is recommending zoning, and this MBTA task force does not have a grasp of zoning. So any suggestions? recommendations that comes out of this board based on the meeting that I listened to last week, I am very concerned that we have delegated this duty to people that have not read the law, don't understand the law, and don't understand the basics of zoning. I would like that on the record and then minutes. Thank you. I would like for the record to say thank you for your comment. See what they produce. I did send a PowerPoint that uh, the state uh, that I thought yeah. you may want to distribute to your board. Mm -hmm. Thank That's you. Have some pretty basic things. Okay, thank you. Um, just on liaison task force working group updates, uh, the Cent Coastal Zone Management Steering Committee. Yeah, Anything that's not the on? name of that committee. I think it's the Coastal Action Plan, uh, but that work has closed out. The, the mm -hmm. Final, yeah, as I updated last time, the, the consultant made the final presentation. No. We um, no. commented that it will be, I think it's a great stand now. Okay, so Harbor Management. There's a uh, website for it, so it should all be on there. Okay. Harbor Management plan, uh, Sarah, any? Uh, the meeting was postponed and hasn't been yet rescheduled. Uh, FEMA map floodplain, this is going to be, you're going to provide a template. Okay. Um, Water Resource Task Force, they, we met on the 19th. Um, I sent you the minute draft minutes in your meeting packet in case, uh, you know, you, anyone was interested. But um, the main thing out of it was the proposed decision to adopt uh, new water rates by the task force was deferred by the select board to September time frame. In the meantime, the standard... Two and a half percent increase of water rates was approved until the new rate tiers can be further communicated. 
on the CPC. We met on June 29th. We closed out completed projects and dormant accounts. And on other meetings, on June 27th, there was a governance meeting. Um, I sent you the PowerPoint slides in your meeting packet. Uh, tables were arranged by boards and committee that worked closely with each other. I sat with uh, Ann Harrison, John Round, Chuck Dam, Nate Rogers, and Sarah Mellish. Um, we looked at projects where we may intersect. We want to, they want to improve communications, create a liaison pro program and improve that. Well, we're ahead of the curve there. We've already done that. Uh, and improve the town website. Those were some of the things. And then they want to have annual multi-board meetings to have goal sharing. So I will keep you informed on anything moving forward with that. Um, Gail's not here, but she did post meeting minutes from June 6th and June 12th. Um, anybody uh, have a, uh, do I hear a motion I need to approve? Second. Any changes to the minutes? Approve as written. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, hands. Hands. Okay. I have a question on minutes. So we had, um, a subcommittee for the um, zoning with, with Jonathan. Um, but I don't think we have minutes for that. You, I think you were there. Um, Betsy, Mary was there. Ron and I were there. I can work with you to draft those. And then uh, there was a subcommittee. Anyway, I believe it was May 15th. But there were also um, the uh, rules and regulations subcommittee met. Have those had meeting minutes yet? Yeah, they were published. Are they, are they on in our packet? Are they have they been in our packet? We voted on them like a month ago. Okay. Oh, no, 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 the the rules and regulations subcommittee. They're in our packet. They were. We voted on them. We all did. Well, we we were wouldn't we wouldn't have voted anyway. If you can just send um. They're posted. Okay. Can you just send uh when you send me an email with where those are? Versus finding them on the website. Just what the dates were, so I can look them up. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, so, I have just one. Uh, so, next, our next meeting is scheduled for August 14th. We traditionally, try to meet only once in August. My suggestion is that we meet next on August 28th. Um, our agendas are going to be pretty light now. Um, that's... Um, so I'm thinking of canceling the August 14th meeting. I know Sarah and Betsy won't be there in any case. So um, we kind of had a tough time. We had a tough time, as you know, last meeting. We didn't get a quorum. So um, any objections to cancel? Not an objection, but just a comment. If there is, um, the August 28th is closer to Labor Day weekend. So that might be more. I might miss that one. I'm not sure yet, but it's closer to a holiday weekend. So. If there's a no, I, well, sure, you know, why not? But <laughs> I would vote for canceling the 28th. If, but I don't know who else is going to be. Well, I have nothing there. to do on the four. They have nothing uh, right now. I can't. No, you don't no, have anything for the 14th. No, I don't have anything. Uh, well, just the discussion that we wanted to move to the next meeting that we were just the talking data. about the data. Uh, the data. data. We can discuss time. that, but that's you won't be here. So. Oh, I might. I actually well, we might have be the data. Here. By oh, you will be here. Yeah. Oh. So we can uh, maybe cancel the 28th and uh, keep the 14th. Uh, I will entertain that. Yeah, because I think if we want to start with these. Um, yeah, yeah, so you'll be here for the data. Yeah, I think so. So the meeting will be on the data. should be pretty short, I think. That's all I have for now. So any objection to, well, we can talk about the 28th on the 14th. So, yeah, I'll take a, any other comment, any other matters? Take a motion to return. So moved. All those in favor? See you on the 14th. See you on the 14th. I, I, I might know they're coming by soon, but.